Father Malachi. <laughs> Matt, what's up? Um, not much. Last time we met, we were at a pub in Manhattan. That's true. Facts. Because I was given a talk for, to some young adult group. Yeah. You said something that I have since said multiple times. All right. You said that when people ask you what you are, mm. you be, depending on where you are in the country, depends mm -hmm. on how you, what you said. <clears throat> Did you remember saying this? Yes. All right. To tell the story. Because well, I, I liked it. Yeah. So it depends on where I'm at is how I'm going to respond. Because if it's like totally out of context, then somebody's just going to stare at you. Like you say, I'm a Franciscan and it's like, you just gave me new information. You might as well have just said like, you know, like a purple people leader. You know, it's like bubbled your lips. Yeah. yeah. So I remember once being in a um, Zaxby's. So down south from Georgia, I was in a Zaxby's and this guy's standing in line, definitely like eyeing me the whole time while we're waiting to order. I'm there with my dad. I'm just like, okay, you know, I go to Georgia and generally speaking, people stare at me because you don't see these kind of like, you know, the bearded dudes is like, I'm not a Muslim. Cross, 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 yeah. cross, you know. Um and, uh, and I was sitting there waiting in line uh -huh. and this guy's sitting there and he's looking at me and then I turn and smile at him and say like, you know, you know, God bless you. And he looks at me, he was like, what is you? Oh, and I'm God. just sort of like, ah, I was like, again, I almost wanted to start with Franciscan, but then I realized I was like, if I say that, it's going to be totally meaningless. I said, well, I was like, I'm a guy who's met Jesus. And I'm trying to live the gospel and doing it after the example of this guy who lived 800 years ago called St. Francis. And those other guys doing the same thing. So we try and serve the poor and preach the gospel. And he was like, amen. Yeah, <laughs> I, like, I like it. So you're in the South. So you, I'm in the South. You, you do, lead with You lead with Jesus, Jesus yeah. every single time. Yeah. You talk Jesus and people are like, amen. You're going to get a lot of amens, you know, whether it's from the teller or the person who's in line with you waiting. But if you're in New York, um, if in you're in New York, okay, and, and first away from the friary, so that away from the friary. Okay, you, yeah. so that again, like it depends on what part of the city. But in general, what I would say for people is, is like you know, I'm a Franciscan, and up there, it actually like people know the Franciscans. There's missions, there's homeless shelters, there's soup kitchens. So you say Franciscan, and it means something. But in particular, also like Catholic priest. Now, you know, depending on who they are, that can solicit different types of reactions. But I'm sort of one of those guys, like, hey, this is who I am. You know, like I'm a Catholic priest. I'm a Franciscan, um, and still it seems like, you know, there's more and more people that don't even have that point of reference, like with faith, God, religion. And so for me, one of the things, again, I go back to is like, what's my experience been of God? And sharing that with them, it's like, I met this guy who totally changed my entire life. And let me tell you about that. <laughs> so I remember you saying that you lead with the poor. Oh, yeah. Because if you're in New York and they're like, what are you? And you're like, we help the poor. Well, that's, yeah. that's good. I like Amen. that. Yeah. Amen. But if you're in California... If you're in California, you remember this? bro, you're, you're I like, don't I got, I got sandals. Come on. I just like to, <laughs> I like to live simply. Yo, Franciscan that's simplicity. What you said. And I thought that's really good. Yeah. So like, you, how do you wedge your way in? Yeah. Find the point of contact with somebody. Like what's the shared humanity that we have in the place where we can meet? Um, because one thing I remember a long time ago, there was a talk I was at and this woman was speaking. It was connected with Courage Ministry, which I've done work with. And she said, you know what? Conversion only happens in the context of relationship. Mm -hmm. So whatever we can do, and there are limits, but whatever we can do to maintain or establish relationship, that's something that's a good that's worth fighting for because it's only in the relationship that there's a possibility for conversion to be happening. And also you realize it's a mutual thing. Like I'm also called to deeper conversion in that relationship. It's not a one-way street. Yeah. Um, so it's always like looking for like, where is there a place where we can stand together mm -hmm. and then like look out from there and then well, like, cool. you know, hey, this is my experience of God. You know, this is the way that he's transformed my life. And you know what? It's not just for me. <laughs> it's actually for you too. This is a question I like asking Franciscans and Dominicans because mm -hmm. it just interests me. So, like, tell mm -hmm. me the, about the reactions you get for wearing that thing. Oof, man. Well, they're varied. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously, but it's really interesting. I was literally in an airport in Denver. So, in Denver has these, like, long, like, uh, like terminal oh, wings. Oh, no. And, like, in, and so there's all these walking sidewalks. Well, yeah. I was, like, traveling all day. And so sometimes I'm like, I don't really want to use the walking sidewalk. I need to actually get steps in kind of thing. Like, yeah. do something physical. Yeah. And I'm walking. And there's somebody coming the other direction with their little kid holding their hand. And the little kid just looks up at me and points and says, 
Jesus! Oh, <laughs> Which is like, you know, I was like, beautiful. I was like, yeah, amen, praise him, you know? Yeah. Um, and I had another experience recently. It was quite fascinating where I was on my way to Hermitage. So every month we go and take a couple of days just to be in solitude with the Lord as part of our way of life as CFRs. <clears throat> and on my way, I realized something really phenomenal, I would say miraculous, happened with the New York Thruway recently. They redid all of their, like, you know, little, like, travel stop places and each of them now has Chick-fil-A. Where, where is the New York? This is New York. In the airport? No, like when you're driving on the thruway heading north, okay. all of the all of the stops now have Chick-fil-A. Now God. I'm from Georgia, cool. so it's like, I mean, it's just like the promised land came to Egypt, you know? So, yeah. so, so I'm stopping in to, to get a chicken biscuit on my way up to Hermitage. Mm -hmm. I walk in. And there's like a little bit of, it seems like a bit of a tiff between the staff. No one else is in line in front of me. I just walk in, which is a rare thing in a Chick-fil-A. But um, it was an off hour. And as I'm coming up to the counter, one of the girls says, hey, somebody's here. You need to get over that register. And she turns around and walks over. And she's like kind of like caught in her mind and whatever she was talking about. And then she looks up and she was like, this is just what we needed. And she turns around. She was like, look, God. <laughs> And I was like, and she points down at the cross. Oh, I see. Because for people, like the cross continues to be a sign, right? Of like, yeah. of, of Christ, of God, of the presence of the Lord, the love of Jesus. Yeah. And so it was just the funniest thing. And she's like sitting there. I was like, I was like, well, she was like, so, so, so what are you, you know? And I was like, well, I was like, I'm a Franciscan Catholic priest. Again, like I was like, you're not getting traction or response. So I'm like, okay, I follow Jesus. She was like, mm, amen. Good. And I was like, you know, and, and I was like, so it's like, what's going on here this morning? She was like, you don't even want to know, but we need God here. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and I was like, we all need some God. And um, she, and so we talked and I was like, you know, we'll just say a little prayer. She was like, yeah. So I like prayed with her and then she called the manager over and we're like, bless them and wow. bless Chick-fil-A. And then she looks at me and she's going to ring up this chicken biscuit. And she was like, I'm putting god's name down on this order and literally so i have a chick-fil-a receipt that says god <laughs> chicken biscuit you know it's just like this this openness that occurs when people see somebody who's a sign because the habit is meant to be a sign right of contradiction yeah. a sign of something beyond this world and pointing to the lord i mean we don't wear it for ourselves certainly not comfortable definitely not during the summer yeah. um but as a sign to others and also to myself now that being said, you obviously get the complete converse like response at times. Let's like, do that. So that's like walking through New York uh -huh. and then um, having somebody come up and say things that I don't want to repeat on the show because you have to do a lot of editing uh -huh. and just like yelling in my face and just like making like these gross gestures towards me because because I represent the church, I represent mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And you kind of see this like, you know, pretty radical responses. Which is, it, it's so bizarre. Cause I mean, in New York city, you've got every, you've got the weirdest looking people wearing the weirdest That's things, a fact. you know, all sorts of hair yeah. and men wearing dresses and apparently everyone can wear everything, Yes, but not you. <laughs> well, no. And I think part of that is, is because you can, I mean, we know this in the public sphere, you can talk about anything, just not Jesus. Mm. You could even talk about God and to a certain in degree a sort of get away with it. Sense. Yeah, you get yeah. if you stay generic enough and sort of in that sort of mm -hmm. like spiritual, ethereal realm, maybe even a bit sort of mystical sounding, people are like, okay, because it doesn't demand anything of me. Yeah. And it doesn't touch on the concreteness of my life. Which is summed up in I'm spiritual, not religious. Yeah, exactly. But as soon as you say Jesus, mm. like you know there's power in the name. And I think there's something about the cross, like the, I love the simplicity of our habit mm -hmm. where we have this simple wooden cross and there's no way that you could look at that and sort of like confuse it for jewelry or for some sort mm -hmm. of like apparel accessory. Like it's very clear, like the simplicity of the cross and throughout all of history, like we know St. Paul himself, I mean, in his time talked about mm -hmm. how, guess what? The only thing I'm gonna preach is Jesus Christ and him crucified who's this stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And there's this sign of contradiction that Jesus, I think, continues mm -hmm. to remain in our own time. My friend, Father Jason, and I recently mm. went to Ukraine and we went through Turkey. Mm. Okay? And so we're in this long line for about 40 minutes surrounded by people, Muslims, we could tell. And of course, Father mm. Jason has the large <laughs> Byzantine cross. And Come we, on. We got to the end and it turned out you're, you shouldn't be here. You need to go pay for a visa, then you come this way. 
Mm. And, you know, it was a long trip. I was kind of tired and I was like, something like just expressed some disappointment. He Mm -hmm. said, but what a joy to give witness to Christ for 45 minutes like Mm. that. And he held up, you're a better man than me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that happened for me as well. I was was at a seminary trip and I happened to be on the Temple Mount because there was a group that let us in. But like Mm. all of a sudden it became very clear like that there was this reaction to the cross, it was on my habit, mm-hmm. being on the Temple Mount. It's just how, like, what was why? the reaction? I mean, the reaction was, was like, you can't have that here. Yeah. And you're just sort of <sighs> sign of contradiction. It continues to be that sort of provocation. So what did you do? Um, in the in the moment, well, I had somebody who was there who was a seminary professor who uh-huh. kind of intervened in the situation. If it was my choice, I probably would have like pulled it out and been like, "You mean this? I can't have this here. This, you know." Um, I'm I'm from Georgia, so naturally like a fighter, sort of mm-hmm. like military family background. So I'm you know as much as Saint Francis is a man of peace, I have to work on conversion of heart mm-hmm. in that regard. Um, but but I think you know it's like this sign to the world of a God who is not somehow distant but near to us like Christ is in the mystery of the incarnation and also a sign to the world that this God that comes near to us is calling us into relationship through the path of repentance. Mm -hmm. It's like the first words of the gospel, right? That Jesus speaks, repent and believe. Mm -hmm. And this call to conversion, which is the call of the gospel, the call of Jesus Christ. That's right. Like the world, some sometimes like, I don't want to hear that. I mean, there's days I don't want to hear. It's like, I don't want to hear. But the world, it seems today in a very real way is like absolutely um, just revolting against anything and anyone that would offer me like an invitation that there might be something wrong with my life That's right. that needs to change. Uh, so Thomas Aquinas looking at the daughters of lust. One, mm-hmm. of, one of them is hatred of God. Mm. And he says this because exactly what you're saying. We hate whoever puts impositions on us. Yeah. Yeah, I was just reading Thomas Aquinas' commentary on the Beatitudes yesterday mm. and today, and it's the same thing. Mm. It's so contrary. Um, you got to mourn. you got to be poor. Mm-hmm. you got to be meek. Yeah. Right? Which is the opposite of taking revenge. Yes. So if you want Beatitude, which we all want, mm. you can have it, but you can only have it through dying. <coughs> I think it's really important that we look at the Beatitudes or Christ's call afresh by just acknowledging, I don't know what this means and mm-hmm. I need to. I think so mm-hmm. often I go and be like, yeah, I get it. And when you yeah. get something, you're not you're not interested in learning something yeah. if you've already gotten it. You yeah. Know? And there's actually something that, um, you know, church fathers speak about where describing people's attempts at trying to sort of grasp in their totality the mystery of God is they're like, if if you believe that you have the answer and that you have fully understood, then you mm, know that what you're talking God. about is not God. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's a way in which if I'm reading scripture and I believe that I have sort of mastered and drawn all that is possible to be received from any passage, <clears throat> then, then it's no longer the word of God to mm-hmm, me mm-hmm. because the word of God is infinite in riches and depth of meaning. And also there's a poverty, there's a beautiful experience. And I have this, like we have two hours of prayer each day Hmm. as part of our life. So one of them is a private hour of meditation in the morning. Another is a Eucharistic holy hour. And there's times where it's like you pick up the gospel and you read it and you're sitting there and you're like, I'm getting nothing. Mm-hmm. Or I don't know what the heck this means. It's, I may as well be reading the back of a cereal box. Sometimes. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And so like, what do I do with that? And right. so like the, the, the sort of first impulse is to either like reduce it and give a simplistic explanation that makes me feel good about myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, I understand that. This means X, Y, or Z. Or, you know, like that doesn't, that's not worth my time. Like this is boring or just sort of like move on to something that's got a little bit more interest and depth to it. But the real response that the Lord, I think, asked for us is like the poverty to sit there and just be like, God, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. And without your light, I can't know. And this kind of response before God and mystery and the faith, I think, is something that modern man lacks, like with that sort of unfolding quest to, to dominate all of material reality through human reasoning and science and technology. There's this hubris that has consumed humanity with this kind of judgment that I am capable of encompassing all, understanding all, dominating all, controlling all. 
Which is the opposite of receptivity. Yeah. And the opposite of wonder before the mystery. And the kind of poverty that's allowing myself to stand before this and be like, yeah, I don't even know what this means. But I know that here is hidden the truth and wisdom that's the foundation of everything that is. And here is the salvation that I'm looking for. And all I can do is stand here, that kind of the, the, Mm -hmm. the poor in spirit. Right? That's the beatitude, the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so the kingdom is received in my poverty, not in my having all the answers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's a posture that modern man just loathes. And I mean, I'm modern man too, so it's not, yeah. sort, of, I'm not sort of like, you know, oh, everybody. Else. It's like, no, like I, I struggle to sit in that poverty, but that's the thing well, that I, I... I find, and I'm sure this is true of many of us, Rather than acknowledging where we are in our mm. wretchedness and begging for God's guidance and grace and virtue, we pretend to be where we wish we were mm. and pretend we live in that role. And oh, I'll give yeah. you a couple of examples, right? So so one is I've just realized how annoying I find the poor mm. here in Steubenville, particular mm-hmm. people, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of poor here and they I know them and I know their names and they'll mm-hmm. shout out to me or they'll continually give me the same story as to why they need money. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm annoyed. But I'm embarrassed mm. that I'm annoyed. So I wouldn't acknowledge to you or myself that I'm annoyed by that. Mm. I would much rather somehow pretend to myself that I'm not annoyed. Mm. But if I pretend to myself that I'm somewhere other than where I am, yeah. then the Lord can't take me by the hand and lead me to where he wants me to be. Amen. Because I think we have a we have no trouble saying I'm a sinner. But then you go, oh, yeah. really? Tell me exactly how you're a sinner. <laughs> oh, no, no, no I'm not going to do that. This isn't confession. No, no that's, <laughs> I think we're all too comfortable saying, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm wretched. I'm a sinner. Yeah. But then when it comes down to acknowledging something embarrassing like that, it's mm-hmm. like, that's that's where we got to be. Like just sitting yeah. in front of the scriptures being like, I don't like this. I wish I did. Yeah. I would like to like it, but I yeah. don't like it. I'd rather be doing something like, don't mm-hmm. you think that that vulnerability before the Lord and then saying, yeah, because because the only place that conversion right can take place in my life is is in my heart. Like it's a there's there's this 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 reality that Francis had this encounter with God that radically transformed his entire existence, and it gave birth to this like obsession not with being poor in the sense of not having things, but with acknowledging the full weight of his like created existence. And with that weight of knowing like that everything is gift and therefore nothing is mine. And this sort of like way in which his heart just opened up the vulnerability to say like, I don't have the answers. I'm actually not in control of anything. Mm. I mean, I look back and that was one of the things like the Lord did a big purge on me during the beginning of COVID. So I'm a, I'm, I call myself a pandemic priest. So yeah. I was ordained in 2020. Oh, wow. May 30th, 2020. Okay. So we're like... How many people were at your order? Uh, 10. Okay. And well, yeah. Before you get to your point, what was that like for you? I'm sure you look forward to this day. You have an idea of what the Bro, day of ordination would well, be this like. Well, was, this was kind of the thing that God was teaching me in that moment. It was related. It's like all of a sudden I'm moving towards this objective, concrete good, right? The priesthood. I mean, my call to the priesthood was something that had happened a couple of decades earlier. And it was like the anticipation. I was a friar already for 12 years. And it was like all these different people and streams of life that were kind of going to be converging in St. Patrick's Cathedral and, you know, a few thousand people and the Cardinal and beautiful Scola, all of it. Right. And you're just pumped about this. And then all of a sudden, this thing that's before you that you're looking towards is taken away. And I remember it was like all of a sudden like this immense anxiety began to just rise up in this frustration and this anger. And, and as I was looking towards this good that was being, it was like more and more stripped away, stripped away, stripped away. First, it's like, we're going to delay then. We don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know where it's going to happen. We don't know who could come if it does happen. And all these questions that were there, all this uncertainty. And I remember the Lord just showing me this, this truth, which was every place in my heart where I was experiencing anxiety and fear and frustration was a place in my heart where something or someone other than Jesus Christ had become the center. Mm-hmm. And so this realization led to like, right, like this repentance. It was like, God, like I've made an idol out of my own ordination. Beautiful. I've made the an honesty, I, the honesty. you know like I've made I've made an idol out of my preferences. Yeah. Can you, um, can you get into some of the specific things that you were anxious about, you know? So first was is it was like I'm the second of eight kids in my family. Yeah. 
And I'm like, all of a sudden it was like, don't even know like who's going to be able to come or not come. So I'm anxious about just this moment that I've longed to share so deeply. And it's like, all of a sudden it's like, I'm not going to be able to share that maybe like with the people that I love the deepest and the dearest in my life. I'm like, God, are you sure you didn't totally screw this one up? You Mm -hmm. know? And it was like, of all the years, it had to be this year. And so like, that was a piece of it. And then the externals, like, I mean, being ordained in St. Patrick Cathedral is kind of epic and beautiful and the skull and the choir is like, I'm looking forward to that, like in my humanity. And it was like, and I'm like, Jesus, like, why, why are you allowing this to happen? And then beyond that, right, was it like all of a sudden I'm being ordained into a situation where like mass can't be celebrated publicly. I was like, what the heck? Why? Like, what's going on? It was just like all these different things that were like what I was anticipating and looking forward to were things that started to just be taken away. And in that gift of being stripped of all of these things was an opportunity to recognize again that everything is gift. And so it's not up to me to determine how and when the gift is given. Mm. It's up to me to have this posture of receptivity to the gift and a poverty that's like, Lord, like I'm before that scripture. And it's like, I might be here for a week in front of this gospel passage. It means nothing to me right now. Mm -hmm. And I can't decide when and how the Lord's going to give the gift of a light that might reveal a deeper truth to me through that word. Or I'm in front of this mystery of like my ordination, when's it going to happen? And I remember, you know, one of the greatest gifts I received was from my father during this time. And I was trying to figure out like, do I wait or not? So basically the way it unfolded was, is the Cardinal um, of New York, Cardinal Dolan said, you guys, we don't know what we're going to do. Figure out and do what you were going to do on your own. So we're like, okay, so now we're free to sort of come up with our own plan. So you could have potentially push could have it waited. a year forward or yeah, could yeah. Have, there's different options you could wait to whenever the archdiocese of new york might decide that they're going to do it which like you know if you yeah. archdiocese everywhere are kind of similar you know it's like yeah there's a there's, pace. exactly bro and so i was like don't want to do that and then it's like well now where are you going to get you and find a bishop so we find a bishop and then it's this question of like do you wait like all this you know like two more weeks of lockdown and right. then we're all going to be able to do normal things again you know what level we're at i don't know all the numbers and colors and all this stuff about like levels of like coming out of the lockdown and it was like, well, what do I do? Do I wait or do I move forward knowing if I move forward that like people that I love will not be there? Not just kind of like my really dear friends, but like my brothers and my sisters, you mm-hmm. know, and you're just like. And who were you discerning this with? It was me and the other brother that were going to be ordained. And was it something where and it the was two something... of you had to be in agreement one way or the other? Okay. And his family, he's from Ireland, Father mm-hmm. Oshin. And he said, bro, he was like, I'll do whatever you want. He was like, it doesn't matter what we do. My family's not going to be here Mm -hmm. because they're on the other side of the Atlantic Mm -hmm. and the borders are closed. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, but I'll just, he was like, he was like, I'm happy and would be, you know, open to being ordained as soon as we can. But I know that your family might be able to come if we wait. So like whatever you want to do. And and I remember I called my dad, told him all of this. And I'm just like wrestling, like, what do I do here, Jesus? And my dad on the phone, I just never forget. He says to me, he was like, son, he was like, I'm not going to tell you what decision to make, but whatever decision you make, I just want you to think about the whole family. And I was like, thank you, dad. And he was like, and my dad has this thing. Well, he'll like say something and then he'll say, and what I mean by, Mm -hmm. and so like he says, what do you think about the whole family? And he says to me, he says, son, what I mean by the whole family is the church. Come on. The church needs priests. That's awesome. He was like, and I'd love to be there, but if I can't, don't wait. Mm-hmm. And like, it was just like, that word just gave me the clarity of like, it's Jesus alone. It's for him alone. It's his priesthood. It's his gift. And it's, and it's for the sake of the family, the church. And so Two weeks later, it was ordained. There was 10 people there. And where were you? St. Patrick's? Or no, we no. were at our friary okay. in Newark, New Jersey. Yeah. So most blessed the sacrament friary. So what was that day like? What was the ceremony like with 10 people? Um, so honestly, there was a beautiful simplicity that I experienced. That I don't know if I would have missed so much had it been otherwise. Wow. Because there was nothing but the right. 
Yeah. And when you strip away everything else, our our scola was two brothers in the back corner singing through a doorway, so they didn't count <laughs> as ten. <laughs> Don't tell anybody that. You know, <laughs> that's right. It's just a private conversation. Exactly, this right? isn't going out. Yeah. So you know, and um, and then there was the brother that was live streaming it, so that people could connect virtually. The bishop, my religious superior, a brother who was the MC, this other brother. And, and God was gracious enough, my mom and dad could come and one of my brothers, mm. um, but that was it. And Where it was, was the bishop from? Who? The bishop, Bishop Manny Cruz, who's an auxiliary in Newark. Okay. And he was a good friend of our community beforehand. He's mm. Cuban American, just fiery guy. And it was funny cause like we're there just before things are starting to unfold. Mm. And it was not sure like, how's this gonna go? Like, do we have to wear masks, face shields, gloves? There's all Come the, on. do you remember? It was I insane. Remember. It was and in, in New York city. I can't imagine what it was like for you, dude, poor bugger. Dude, I was about to like, I was about to go nuts. I mean, before that day, I was already about to go nuts. Mm. And so anyhow, we're there and we're like, how's this all gonna go? And he shows up and, and the Bishop says, you know what? He was like, we can't wear masks. He was like, this is our nation. He was like, we can't. He was like, Good man. he was like, he was like, you know, he was like, we're just going to celebrate this ordination. Okay. And you were like, yes, and it was father. like, thank you. Yeah. And then this man just like opened up his fatherly heart to us. And it was like embracing us, you know, cause like, well, all these people like, don't touch me. Yeah. Give me six feet. You know, it was all oh, that. So it was, glad yeah. that's done. Yeah, amen. And, um, and it was this moment where. I was in the midst of that. And I remember just like having this experience where just all the different parts of the right became so much more like present and real because there was nothing else happening. There was, n I mean, again, it was like, it was just the ordination, right? And I remember going forward, having my hands anointed and then having this moment where like the bishop and Manny Cruz is like Cuban American. So like Latino, Latino sometimes can be like over the top, you know, it's like I lived in Central America. It was like, you went intense, you know, go Latino, right? Think about hot sauce. And, um, and so like he puts oil on our hands and then they're there. And then I see him look at the oil on our hands, a chrism, you just smell it, right? And he's like looking and he's almost dumb. He's like, no. And then he's like, almost like scoops and just takes oil and just like lines every part of the surface. And I had literally like a pool of chrism in my hands. And I remember just like walking with this and just looking down and just like the Lord, just like these hands have been anointed for others. And I just knew like that ordination wasn't for me. And I think if it hadn't happened the way that it did, it would have been for me. Mm. And there was this gift of realizing this is a gift. The priesthood is a gift and it's not for me. It's for the church. It's for the family. And I had the blessing of being able to spend the first six months celebrating more masses in people's homes than I did in churches mm -hmm. because public masses weren't allowed. So mm -hmm. just had to celebrate private masses <laughs> <laughs> and doing wild things like hearing confessions in Central Park by sending out, you know, like uh, Google map pen drops to like people in the city that's like, Hey, we're here at this location. If you want confession, come on. And, you know, just like this gift of being able to like experience a power of bringing people to the Eucharist for the first time in months, you just see the look in their eyes of like longing, like talk about Eucharistic hunger and like this thirsting for the Lord. And again, like all of this, because the Lord allowed me the gift of being stripped of the things that I was putting at the center of my life that wasn't him and giving me this gift of receiving as, as, as something that's his and not my own, my priesthood that's for others and not for me and not about me at the end of the day. Um, so I'm so thankful in an unexpected way that's wonderful. that Jesus allowed that to happen the way that it did. So do you come from a small town in Georgia? Augusta. Or, uh, Augusta. So it's, Augusta. it's, yeah, it's a city, you know, yeah. I mean, we've got the masters. So if you like golf, you're definitely going to know about but of it. Of course, compared to uh, New York city, it may as well be. Oh a, my goodness. Well, yeah. yeah. Holy very cow. Small town. So what was it like getting used to the sound? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll of never forget city. that postulancy arriving in Harlem, and in, yeah, Harlem, yeah. Harlem and like all of a sudden showing up and I'm like going to lay down at night. And then all of a sudden there's just like, one side of the building gangster rap and the other side reggaeton. So you're just sort of like caught between these like sound walls, <laughs> competing groups that are trying to like claim the night air and sound by their big boom boxes and everything. It is like, 
I'm just sitting there and I remember I was like sitting in holy hour and I'm like totally like ADHD if anyhow they didn't diagnose people when we were younger I think we're about the same age and um thank god for that and I'm taking medication but I uh I definitely get distracted easily and I remember just being there and just like what how am I supposed to make a holy hour when there's literally somebody outside my window you know just like and I remember it was like just this like transition that happened over time where I just had to make this choice. It was like, Jesus, I can't pray right now. You talk about the honesty. It was like, I can't even like pay attention to you, Lord. The most I can do is just hope to like, just stay in this chair and not get angry. <laughs> That's all I can do. And like for a while, that was my prayer. Uh, yeah. Literally, holy hour was me sitting there like, Lord, not to be angry. <laughs> don't be pissed off at this person out the window. The, you know, stop arguing. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. it's like, is there domestic abuse going on outside my window right now? It's just like the way people are screaming. And I mean, coming from Georgia, totally different culture. Mm. But over time, a really beautiful thing happens, right? Like as a missionary and as someone who's called into ministry is that the Lord opens up the opportunity to begin to see people the way that he sees them. And when that happens, you fall in love. Like God's in love with humanity. Jesus was in love with everyone. Mm-hmm. And even in spite of how annoying I can be, like he loves me, <laughs> right? And And like... That type of a heart, which is the heart of Jesus, is something that I think spending time in adoration without knowing it happens. And I remember there was this like just time where I don't know how it happened, but at some point along the trajectory of my life as a friar, it's been, I think, almost 16 years now, 15, 16 years, something like that mm-hmm. as a friar. When did you join? What 2008. Year? Okay. That's yeah. cool. I was married in 2006. Okay. So we so- kind of have a similar... Yeah, uh, yeah, similar age, similar vocation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So that yeah. back in 2008 when I joined, like I could, I was just trying not to get pissed off. Yeah. And now it's like I'm I'm sitting in the chapel, and this like music still is going in the Bronx. It hasn't stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? Doesn't stop. City doesn't sleep. It's true. Trust yeah, me, Ben. Yeah, yeah. Um, although wintertime may be a little bit calmer, but I'm sitting there and I smile. Because I start thinking of the faces of all these people I know. Mm. And instead of just being like this annoying distraction, it becomes this like sign of like these people that the Lord sent me to that my heart's fallen in love with. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that happens. Because the first time I came to New York, I was like, great to visit. Never, ever, ever, ever living there. (laughs) Did I say ever? (laughs) It was like... And, and here's the Lord, like, you know, and it's kind of like, I don't know, I don't think it's twisted humor, but I think there's sort of this kind of you like. You know, what's funny is I'm thinking of Therese of Lisieux, who has that story of the sister who would rattle the beads, so it oh, would knock yeah. against the wood. And mm-hmm. I'm like, but what you're dealing with is like 211. It's Yo, a whole different. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, there's you're no. Like, I would kill for silence and the rattling of beads. Although I do have to say with the rattling of beads thing, I still remember from my postulacy, I wanted to sort of like wrangle the neck of one of my classmates because he had uh, uh, he had an analog watch that had a little tick. Oh, no. Tick. The second hand. No. Just so subtle and just so. But I, if excommunicated. Were, Yo, I'm like, and I'm just sort of like, He's doing this just because he wants to <laughs> drive right. me nuts. So, so this is interesting, right? Because I serve with Net Ministries, who you yeah. might be familiar with. Oh, yeah. And this is a couple of years after my conversion. So I'm just on fire with the mm-hmm. love of Jesus. And if I would meet another Christian, I would just want to rejoice in this thing we had both found, yeah. or had found us. So when I was about to do Net, I thought, I know they're talking about conflict resolutions, but mm-hmm. we're not going to need to do that because we both love Jesus. And then the way your brother squeezes his toothpaste. You're like, I hate him. I actually hate him. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, it's just marvel at this. And then like, I mean, as a friar, this happens like in so many different ways. It's like, you have like, you know, like most, and it doesn't change too. Cause I'm like, I'm, you know, 15 years in with friars that are my friary. And it's like recently we're like, we're like arguing about like, um, you know, what kind of stopper we're going to use for like the drain and the sink because one guy's like doesn't like the one that has uh, that you can pull up and like water goes yeah. through and the other one's like just like a solid seal one ridiculous like who cares i do everybody apparently. everybody <laughs> you know exactly so like it's fun I, don't, I think it's something i don't know i believe part of it i think personally is like the lord just wants us to grow in love when this is good because before i was married i thought i was a pretty reasonable fella yeah and then you live with people 
Mm-hmm. And the first thing you realize is how annoying they are. Yeah. And then the Lord <laughs> helps you realize how annoying you are and what they have to put up with. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I was on my own, I would never get to know how annoying I was. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's right. Because I'm awesome. I'm, and everybody yeah. loves me. Yeah. I mean, I love myself anyhow. Yeah, yeah. So why should you? Yeah. That's the joy of community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So when, so you, you, how did you first hear about the Friars? Well, I'm from a community down in Georgia, the lay community called the Alleluia community. So it was a charismatic community, covenant community that started in the early 70s. Mm-hmm. And I had a reversion to my faith kind of in early college. Yeah. And after that was just like on fire and looking for ways to serve. And so my like school breaks from the university, I went to Augusta University back home. It was basically looking for places to do mission work. And our community mm-hmm. has had a longstanding, beautiful relationship with a missionary as a charity. Mm-hmm. So I went to North Carolina, I went to Jenkins, Kentucky, and to the South Bronx. Okay. Um, and, and that's when you first said, I'm never going to live here? Yes, okay. 2002. Mm-hmm. I was like, no way. I spent a summer there. I was like, it was great. The sisters are great. The poor is great. But I did meet the Friars, and and it was pretty awesome. That was Toronto World Youth Day that summer as well. So it was like was summer. Did you go? Yeah. Oh yeah. You didn't say hi. I was. I was I'm sorry, there. bro. That's Apologize. Right. Apologize. Forgive Apologize. you. Air hug. <laughs> <laughs> Reconciliation happening right here, yeah. right now. Um, but the uh, the friars that summer, like just like captured my attention. But I think two things. One is there were just like dudes. Yes. I'm just like I'm like wait a minute. You're just like guys normal, that I, yeah. like I want to like I kind of want to hang out with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing was just like this like zeal that they have for Christ, and mm-hmm. it just came through in all these different ways. We went and spent time with them at their homeless shelter, Padre Pio. Saw them at World Youth Day, and like I don't know if you remember, but like Toronto, they were like sort of rock stars that year. Father Stan had his own massive stage concert. You know, there's like brothers on gym bays. I'm like, who are these people? We're at like Niagara Falls on the way back, and a van load of them show up and pour out, and they're like talking to everybody. You know, hacky sacking, frisbeeing. <sighs> well, it's funny. I remember after World Youth Day in Toronto, being back in Australia, and I got this kind mm. of coffee table book of World Youth Day Toronto. Mm-hmm. And in it was a friar kneeling and praying. And I, mm. and I didn't know who the CFRs were, but I, I wanted to know who that was. Mm. And it, it was this like process of finally finding out who mm. the CFRs were mm-hmm. before the internet's in full swing. Oh, so it's yeah. not that easy. Yeah. And then I actually discerned with the CFRs for a long time, went and wow. stayed with them in London, was in touch with okay. a brother, John, well, brother John Paul, who's brother now John Father Paul, John Paul, Father John Paul for a yeah. while. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting just the witness as as mm-hmm. you experience, just the witness of the friars. Yeah. Know? And like we talked about before, like it's it's kind of like that's why this was something that from the beginning the founders were really insistent on. Right, right. And this was during a time period where, where there the was a lot of people were like, out. Yeah, like we'll use this, you know, we'll wear a habit when we're like praying in a chapel. And it was like, Well, that's not I mean, we know you're like, you know, like doing the God thing, you're in a chapel. It was like the world needs to see that out there on the street. You know, and people. What was it like for the Friars of the Renewal in the beginning, kind of reclaiming their tradition? Did they experience a lot of pushback? Yeah, as, as all things, complicated history. <laughs> but part of that, I think, was was a desire for fidelity, which is mm-hmm. a, here's the thing: like Franciscans are this like group that I think until the Second Coming are perennially going to be having this like desire for like a new. Let's start yes. this thing again. Let's get yes. after it again. And they talk about one of the reasons for this is unlike almost every other religious community that exists, the ideal, the rule, the right. sort of model for what it means to be a Franciscan is not a piece written of paper. in constitution. It's a man, it's a man. Yeah. who was a holy Francis- fool in love with oh, Jesus. Yeah. But interestingly, he says at the end of his life to his brothers, he says, brothers, I've done what is mine. Now you do what is yours. Mm. So what is mine? What does it mean to be like radically faithful to living the gospel in the 21st century? Right. Like a lot of ways to answer that question. And because of that tension, right, is that I think there's this on, this ongoing tension of like, I want to come back to what's authentic right, and right. true. And so the friars began in a time where there was a lot of turmoil in religious life in general. Father Benedict Groeschel, um, who's one of our founders, sort of the main instigator of the renewal, mm-hmm was working with a lot of religious and a lot of priests and had a pulse on like the need for renewal and religious life in the church as part of the authentic renewal that was meant to flow out of the Second Vatican Council. And so the group has as its title, like Friars of the Renewal, not because primarily like involved with the charismatic renewal, Mm -hmm. but because 
at the center of what they sought to do was to seek to renew the church in the way Francis did, which is through a radical endeavor of this like conversion of my own heart and allowing that conversion to be manifest in the way that we live our life, a shared common life Mm -hmm. that had as its anchor prayer, yeah, which flowed into a, a community that was real, not just in name, but like we really shared life as brothers. Like we wash dishes together, we cook for one another. You know, it's like we clean different places in the fry. We live family, right? And to have that be a part of life was something desired. And this proximity to the poor was and, another. And don't you, uh, don't you, st- do you still have no beds? Do you There's sleep no, on the floor? yeah. So like it's either a simple mattress or a mat on the floor. So okay. depending on the brother, you know, it's yeah. like if you have a old dude who can't walk, you might need yeah. a bit of so a thicker the, mattress. Or yeah. Whatever. And I mean, in some friars, it's like getting up and off a of mattress on the floor. It's even an option because their age or health or whatever. Right, right. And so they've got a bed, but it's yeah. like this is. The idea is a simplicity of life yeah. where it's like we want to push ourselves and there's a phrase that's in our constitutions, which is we want to strive to live not by what is the maximum allowed, but the minimum necessary. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And so that's kind of like yeah, a like paradigm. This, of, it's like this culture of dispensation we have in the church. Yeah. Well, it's okay because it's like, well, what yeah. if I went the other way and... And, and yet at the same time, not making an idol out of that, eh? Yeah. Because I'm sure that I could just see the Franciscans all trying to outdo each other. Oh, yeah. And that can be good, like outdoing each other in charity. But yeah. it could also be making an idol out of poverty. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know this or not, but I was with uh, Father Stan Fortuna in the Middle East. Really? Back in 2012, we went and spoke in Abu Dhabi together. <laughs> awesome. And, uh, I remember they said to us, do not mention the prophet you know, at these talks, not really mm-hmm. the prophet, of course, but uh, because there will be people from the government here, you know. And I said, well, look, I'm if I get martyred, it's I know it'll be far. It'll be Father Stan Fortuna and companion. <laughs> and, and I'm not going down for companion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. So no, we, we, we had a really good time together. And he got to tell, tell me some of the history of your order. And so I'm mm-hmm. not sure how much you know, but. I mean, what was the response of the Capuchin order from which you came out? Yeah. I mean, that must have been mixed at best because yeah. it sounded no, like I mean, Benedict Rochelle and the others were like, no, the Lord's not calling us to renew where we are. Yeah. We have to go out. Well, they tried within the Capuchin order during their time, and that was met with resistance. And so they eventually kind of came to an impasse. So the way they speak about it is, is and this is what they've shared with us, is that None of them wanted to stop being Capuchins. They actually just wanted to live what they believed to be the authentic Capuchin way of life. Mm. And their provinces that they were in and the concrete situations they found themselves in was like, we can't do this here. And so they left and there was two reactions, I think. And and I, and I could see both of them as, as like ways that would be appropriate responses depending on your disposition towards them. One was, it was like, you know, like, a little bit of like good riddance, get the headache out of here, you know, adios amigo slash a lot. Good luck. We'll see how yeah, long Yeah, like a certain type of, you know, a criticalness of their mm-hmm. decision and looking down on it. And then there were others that were just like heartbroken because it was like a divorce. Mm. I mean, and even our own founders sort of look back at the founding and they're like a recognition. This is a work of God, but also a sorrow and sadness, especially the older friars. I think some of the younger ones that had just kind of begun their life as Capuchins, it was less felt. But like Father Benedict Rochelle was like, you know, several decades into being a Capuchin mm-hmm. and he left that. And it just to feel the weight of that, right? I think so. There was a two different responses where it was like sorrow, frustration, feeling hurt on one side, and then another sort of like, you know, like critical judgment, you know, good riddance, you know, you know, peace later. And now we can get back to sort of living our life without the encumbrance of feeling like yeah. you're sitting here saying that this isn't our life. That must have been like such a springtime for them. Oh, living yeah. together, was, praying, ministering. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Like, I mean, how did they how did they attain their first friary? You know? Well, this was the Father Bennett Groeschel was the sort of, not the spiritual director, but a, a spiritual friend and confidant of Cardinal O'Connor. Mm. And so when they decided to make this move, they were knew they were going to need to be underneath church authority. It wasn't like, we're just going to do a free for all and go start our own thing. And so he went to the Cardinal and said, we'd like to do this. Will you receive us? And Cardinal O'Connor says to him, I was wondering when you were going to finally come and ask this. Mm. <laughs> so it was sort of like, you know, this go uh, further confirmation for Father Benedict. You know, there's a funny story where he's there early on before kind of this the, the official break. 
and a young brother's coming to him and ta- just talking about his struggles with what's happening in the <laughs> province and the community. And what does he say? He says, in response to like, what are we going to do is what the young friar says to him. And his response is, was, we're going to do something. And he says, as soon as he said that, he knew the Holy Spirit had spoken through him. Mm-hmm. And that he also was realized it's kind of like, oh, pff, crap. I can't believe I just said that. Now this is being set in motion. Like something just happened. Yeah, yeah. I've been wrestling and I just crossed a threshold. So here's, I don't know if you know the story or not, but I was sitting with Father um, Stan Fortuna over breakfast in mm-hmm. Abu Dhabi <laughs> before we went to preach. And he said that it may have been around this time when they're all wondering, like, what are we doing? Uh, and mm-hmm. then Father Benedict Rochelle fa- called Father Stan. And Father Stan's like, hi. And Father Benedict <laughs> said, the axe has been laid to the, the root. Tree. Something like yeah. that. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah what does that mean? <laughs> it's like, Did you, do you know the same story? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Good. The axe has been yeah. laid to the tree. And Father yeah, Stan's yeah, just yeah. like, so, so what does that mean? What are we doing? <laughs> he was like, pack your bags, kid. Come on over. <laughs> We're doing the thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, in that, that, like, they moved into the South Bronx in 1987. It was still Fort Apache. Every building around them was burned out, literally, not like figuratively. Cars yeah. were burned out in the street. The police wouldn't go in there. No way. Like, at all. And y'all set and up they, shop and they, in a place the police wouldn't come if literally. y'all had trouble. And so, and here they are. They move in, and like, and you just see like the miracle of God's providence again and again. This mm-hmm. church that had been abandoned, it was originally uh, St. Adalbert's, it was a Polish national church. Neighborhood had changed, and there were no more Poles in the area, and the church itself was almost non non-exist, existent as a functioning parish. There was wow. an old school building. That when was, is this? 80s, 90s? 87. 87. And yeah. how old Father Benedict roughly about that point? At this point, 60s, uh, 70s? he's going to be late 60s. I just love that someone in their late 60s is like, you know what? I think the Lord's calling me to go live in a burned out area where the police won't show yeah. up if we get into trouble. <laughs> and, wow. you we know, have been 54. 54. 54. Holy cow. Wow. There you go, man. Oh, man. Uh, so, you know, Father Benedict, I mean, the courage for him, there was a lot of people that risked things, but I just think about for him, like the way that he had so much, it was already built. And you're right. Like, it's like, he's not this guy who's at the beginning looking for, because young people, like you say, we want to just like go start something new. And like, you go to a college campus and say that, yeah, let's totally. do something, you know? Yeah. And um, then also, I think when you're that age, you begin to think of your legacy. Mm-hmm. And so the idea that you would trust the Lord to start this crazy adventure, n- having oh, no idea yeah. whether it would succeed or not, going yeah. on faith. Oh, my goodness. I mean, what he always man. said from the beginning, like, it was, it's, this is a work of God. Yeah. He said, just based on the fact that it survived. And he sort of jokingly says in, in the personalities, he was like, <laughs> that we didn't kill each other at the beginning. Tell, tell us about that. Tell us about the different personalities from what well, you know. I mean, so you have Father, you know, Stan Fortuna, yeah. who is just like a, a wild a man. A wild hippie. Yeah, no, I mean, he's hippie, jazz. I mean, I mean, yeah, way, yeah it's like you're like a former jazz band musician yeah. who's like kind of this combination of like Puerto Rican, Italian, you know, Yonkers boy who's like all soul, all heart, but fire, man. Mm-hmm. And then you have Father Benedict, like, you know, so here's like choleric, melancholic father. This is going to be Father Stan, I think, kind of more like choleric. Mel- then you have over here Father Benedict. Mm-hmm. Who like the guy, you know, is like, I think, you know, he was meant to be a CEO of some company, like just a right? vision, gifts, personality, mm-hmm. but this tremendous heart for the poor that were like at the center of his life always like Jesus and the poor from the beginning just occupied him. And it was a place where his heart remained. And, and so like, and he's got the strong vision and a strong personality and ideas of what this should look like. And then you have father Glenn younger. Mm-hmm. A Brooklyn, mm-hmm. uh, Brooklyn Italian guy who's, you know, he's again got all of that sort of like we work things out in our family by yelling at each other. Huh. <laughs> it's like the opposite of the Irish passive aggressive thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. and just sort of like, blah, it's out there. Um, uh. You know, Father Andrew Apostle is probably the, you know, sort of like the, the meekest of them, okay. yeah. sort of the gentle lamb, <laughs> but... If he dug in, he dug in. Okay. And it was like, if he's convinced about something That's and you got to think, what do you have to have inside of you to have the grit to think about doing what they did? Yeah. What are the kind of personalities? Exactly. Right. And so all of those personalities now coming together and trying to hammer out like, what exactly are we doing? 
And what is our life supposed to look like in these first like chapters? And there's like, you know, there's records of this stuff from like, you know, that are in our, that we have access to as community. And like you read something, it's like, holy cow, they talk about like you come out and there'd be blood on the walls, you know, like, like trying to wrestle together. I'm sorry, blood on the walls, inside or outside? In, yeah, inside, inside. <laughs> uh, blood. Yeah. I mean, figuratively speaking. Okay. Not literally. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, let's clarify that. So one. at first, I was like, you were talking about gang fights, blood yes, on the outside yes. walls. I'm like, you got friars getting yeah. into knife fights. But, yes, bro. So it was, it was yeah, yeah, yeah. but there was like the wrestling to be able to try and together discern and know what does it look like to respond radically to the gospel and the Capuchin tradition now at this point in the history of the church. And these guys are all totally sold out and all in. And, and also now Bishop Bob Lombardo, another like just super capable individual with great capacity, vision, leadership. That's why he's a bishop, auxiliary bishop in Chicago, um, who's in the mix as well. Father Robert Stanion, who was, I was telling you about him. He was a sort of a bi-ritual, you know, mm-hmm. Eastern and Latin rite priest. He was a brother initially when the community started, became mm-hmm. a priest later. What was his name? Father Robert Stanion. And um, I just played his last name. St- S-T-A-N-I-O-N. Oh, I-O-N. I-O-N. Yeah. So Father okay. Robert Stanion. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. and so you just have a cast of characters. There's this other guy, Joe Nolan, who was there. I'm trying to think. There's one more that I'm. Oh, Pio Father Mandado. Pio Mandado. Yeah. So Father Pio Mandado is the other one. So all of these guys, and each of them had sort of a different angle on like Franciscan life that was their emphasis. Uh-huh. Father Benedict was like really always wanting to put it back to the poor and evangelization. So kind of the mission oriented part. You had um, oh, some of the brothers that were more emphasis was on like material poverty and simplicity. Others, it was like the fraternal dimension. Others, it were more like the contemplative era medical part of the inheritance. And so each of them came with their sort of part of the life that was really important to them. Yeah. And then now we need to make a life out of this. So just, that's, you know, I mean, brutal. so it's, it's the Holy Spirit. And this is Father Benedict. That's what he says. It's, this is a work of God. <clears throat> Because it was so tenuous. I mean, they had no canonical status for the first year and a half. They were just basically, they weren't laicides, the priests weren't, but they were out of vows. They were they were men without a home. Yeah. They didn't have any official identity in the life of the church. They were just sort of under the shadow and the wing of Cardinal O'Connor to like exist and be here. But you don't actually exist as anything. And you just left the one thing that was your life and vocation, which was being a friar, a capuchin. They have their faculties, though, right? They have they faculties as priests. Are they but, allowed but, to celebrate mass? Yeah, they for were the able, Yeah, but they were they were like you know like they they had to surrender their habits. They had to, like, I mean, it was like a radical. And then they 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 chose and discerned new habits, which is why we have the gray, the original color. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not like a dig. It just sort of is. Go to a CC and you'll see it. Francis's yeah. habits there. Um, it's not dyed. It's exactly. Dyed. So it was the sign of like the poorest material that would be used by the 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 poor, the destitute, would be undyed wool, yeah. which was like a grayish. You it's know, just so color. cool to wear something that makes sense to wear. It's like yeah. uh, these Franciscan. No offense to these beautiful Franciscans that I meet, who are wearing these things. You're like, this is this isn't made for life. Mm. And you'll rip it. You'll. It's not warm <laughs> enough. It's you know. Yeah. Well, there's definitely some ripping and tearing that does happen, but that's mm-hmm. where patches come in, you know. And Francis, actually, I love this about him because we were talking uh, about authenticity before and sort of like being real. And Francis would say he's like, if I have a patch on the inside of my habit, I want to make sure there's one on the outside. Why? And he says because I don't want people to be unaware that I have more padding inside to the cold. Oh, I see. That somehow oh, that, see. that there would be something disingenuous that people yeah. know that like, so there was something about him. He was like this preoccupation with authenticity was part of his life. He was like, you know, that's why when he got up to preach, sometimes he would literally like confess his sins because he says, I don't want you to think that I'm some great saint. Look what I just did. Mm-hmm. You know, and somebody comes up and lauds him as, you know, Il Santo, right? As he's coming into town and he says, you know, be careful what you say. I could still father children yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A man who's just like in touch <laughs> in a really beautiful yeah, yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So the habit is part of that expression for him. I, I share this because I think it's important for people to hear who are watching this video and are wanting to contact the Friars of the Renewal. Mm-hmm. I was chatting with a bishop who was a Franciscan while I was discerning with the Capuchins in Australia. Yeah. And he said to me, don't be, and it's strange that he said this to me, but he said, maybe it's not strange. Don't be afraid if you're attracted to us because of the habit. 
<laughs> and I thought, oh, I am. That's really good to hear because I was mm. so afraid that was too superficial. Yeah. And he said, it's like a woman. You meet a woman, she's got beautiful eyes. That's mm-hmm. that's not why you marry her, but it's yep. okay that that attracts you. Amen. And I thought that was a really good advice. That's yeah. wise. I mean, there's something that we we speak about in formation with the guys and even in some of the discernment process as we tell them, it was like, the reason why you have come here is not the reason why you will stay. Yeah. yeah. And there's a discovery, a deepening of like the call because at the end of the day, like, man, this way of life, I mean, I tell people, I'm like, listen, if Jesus hadn't called me, you can sure as heck bet that I would be living in Georgia where I could get boiled peanuts whenever I want, pulled pork barbecue and watch the Georgia Bulldogs. Mm. You know, it's like, the grace to live the vocation is only there if the call is there. And if it's just something on the surface that's drawn me and yeah. it's not truly the spirit, then then that'll come out. And that's just fine because discernment is like, all right, I'm trying to figure this out. And you out. know that the call is there because you've been ordained. Do you know what I mean? It's not like you continue to question whether the call is there. It's like no. me. Like I, I know I'm married to my wife. Oh, and yeah. I'm committed to her regardless yeah, of the temptations totally. because we are married. Yeah, there's a clear commitment that's made. I don't have to made. be internally you know, looking in oh, yeah. every day to see, am I, am I called to this? It's like, no. no, no, you are because you've been married because you're yeah. a priest. I mean, you know so, this, like, yeah, this gift that's been given. It's like so get my, on your knees and beg for the grace, bro. Amen. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a story, bro, that I think is just something that's helped me or is a part of my journey because... Speaking of that, so 10 years into my religious life, I got to this point where I realized like in my heart, this longing for family and for intimacy and for love was just growing. And, and I realized I was like, I don't know that I'm actually going to be able to be faithful until death mm-hmm. to what I made vows to do. And it was just kind of like a frightening moment of like, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean that I'm not sure if I can actually live what I said I would live? And at this time in the month after sort of in the crisis point, I was able to go on pilgrimage providentially to Medjugorje. Mm. And I showed up there without any expectations, but a lot of openness and had some profound experiences of, of like Our Lady's presence for me in my heart in different ways. But I went to confession when I was there, which is probably one of the most powerful graces I received. Um, no matter what else may or may not be happening, there's a lot of people being reconciled to the Lord through confession there. And I went to confession and I poured out my heart to this priest who was an Irish priest. And I just said, I was like, Father, it's like, I know in my heart, like what I've said yes to, I can't live. Mm. And, and I feel like I'm failing all the time. Like interiorly, it's not like running off and acting in some way, but I just feel like I'm constantly failing to truly have an undivided heart given to Jesus Christ. And, and I don't know what to do. And so this Irish priest starts laughing. Bro, you want to talk about I'm choleric, sanguine. So the choleric side came out. I was just like, what the, <laughs> just like, dude, I'm going to like cold clock you right now. This is not, a, there's not a screen between us. I was like, what? he's like, <laughs> he's like, ah, oh, sounds like you've written yourself a check that you can't cash. And I looked at him. You're like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I did. He was like, you know what you need, son? You need a good cosigner. Why don't you ask Our Lady to co-sign that check, and then I think it'll cash just fine. That is beautiful. <laughs> and wow. I'm just sitting there, and I'm just like, I just started weeping. Wow. Just started weeping. I'm sorry, Be- I wanted to punch dude. you. <laughs> you know, I know. I really, I was like, you don't know how close you were to a black guy. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting here just realizing. I was like, I've been trying to do this on my own. And no vocation is meant to be lived on our own. We make promises to something that's impossible regardless of what the vocation is. Yeah. Impossible for us. Yeah. And just realizing all of a sudden it was like, I have this recourse, this resource, this power through my mother who I can run to and say, listen, like I, I want to run to another woman right now, but I'm running to you. Give me the grace to be faithful yes. to your son, Jesus. Give me the grace not to betray the Lord. And 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 it, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, it's real. Because so, a shift in my heart happened okay. in that moment, okay. yeah. in that time, yeah. and it has been there since. And all of a sudden, like a freedom. And I was like, what the heck is going on? 
I was like, you're absolutely beautiful, drop dead gorgeous, but like beautiful in a different way to me than you were before. Okay. And like seeing with like the eyes of the father. And this is one of the only, like the real grace that I'd specifically asked for this grace at priesthood was to be able to see people with the eyes of the father. And it's like this paradigm for like, when I sense that movement in my heart that wants to grasp Mm -hmm. at that beauty for myself, Mm -hmm or to grasp for something that I feel like I'm wanting from this person in this relationship. It's like, Father, let me see this person as you see. Give me eyes to see your daughter the way you do. And when he gives that grace, it's like, I mean, you're a father, right? It's like, you look at your children, it's like there's there's a disinterested, like Mm -hmm. sacrificial, self-giving love that's in the heart of an authentic father for his children. He's not looking to get anything from them. Any, in as much as he does, there's a perversion of his paternity that's mm-hmm. happened, right? But when you look at them with that real love of a father's heart, it's like, I would do no harm to you. I want nothing from you. I'm rejoicing in you. And I'm only asking the question, what can I do to bless you? Mm-hmm. Beautiful that that's a grace that was given to you, something you didn't orchestrate. It sounds like mm-hmm. a real gift. And yet, given that you're a man who can still father children, so we mm-hmm. should pray for you. And I could still abandon my wife, so we should pray yeah. for me, right? Uh, then how do you deal with the perversions that rear their heads? I mean, it's, this is why I think it's so important to recognize. Eh? It's oh, yeah. Not, it's not one and done. It's like no, this daily battle. No, well, that's where the grace, yeah. I'm talking about like, now I know who to ask to cosign yeah. when the check is bouncing. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, crap, not going to bounce. And that, that's definitely not cashing today. You know, some days it's cashing on its own, maybe. I mean, it probably never really is, but I might think that it is. But there's some days where you're just like, I'm struggling. The struggle's real right now. Yeah. And so what do I need to do? And, and you know, there's, there's some beautiful devotions connected with Our Lady in chastity. Mm-hmm. And one of them that I, I turn to is, is just praying three Hail Marys. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm, so I'm like, as I said, I'm like ADHD. So I'm not the guy who's going to go to heaven because I said the same prayer every day for my whole life. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just not, I'm too sanguine for it. Right. I was like, I, I, so, but there's like prayers that are part of like a sort of Rolodex. Yeah. And when I encounter a situation, this is the one I turn to. And so when I'm struggling in that area of like purity of heart or chastity, I'm down on my knees, literally. Mm. And I'm like, Mary, I ask you for the grace of purity of my mind, of my heart right. and my body. Yeah. And I pray three Hail Marys. Mm-hmm. And she's, she's faithful. I don't know how else to say it. Like, I just keep coming back. And if I feel like I failed, this is where the sacrament of confession is there. You know, it's like, Isn't that great? it's amazing. I mean, I'm just like, are you serious? Like, you're going to forgive me again? And the Lord's sort of like, yeah, it's called infinite mercy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like, hello, you know, like, I was like, you know, it's like that that infinite mercy is like, I don't care what I've done and how many times I've done it. It's always finite. 70 times seven. Yeah. Yeah. This is cool because this is wisdom that was taught to you. But it's something that if you were told before you knew it, say in mm. Medjugorje, you would have nodded sagely to it, right? Oh, yeah. Like if somebody, that's what's so interesting. Yeah. Like you can know things and not know them. Mm. It's kind of like that, what you said to the postulants or mm-hmm. what they say, that the reason yeah. you stay isn't the reason you came. And yeah. even that, I'm sure everyone nods sagely to. Oh, yeah. But then the Lord has to somehow put it inside of your head and heart. Yeah, and, and, you, it, and it becomes part of you. And that's I want to tell you about a course that I have created for men to overcome pornography. It is called strive21.com slash Matt. You go there right now, or if you text strive to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free, and it's a course I've created to help men, to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, We had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, And I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. 
And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text Strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret yeah. it. This is cool because we, this is wisdom that was taught to you. But it's something that if you were told before you knew it, say in mm. Medjugorje, you would have nodded sagely to it, right? Oh, yeah. Like if somebody, that's what's so interesting. Yeah. Like you can know things and not know them. Mm. It's kind of like that, what you said to the postulants or mm -hmm. what they say, that the reason yeah. you stay is and the reason you came. And yeah. even that, I'm sure everyone nods sagely to. Oh, yeah. But then the Lord has to somehow put it inside of your head and heart. Yeah. And, and, you, it, and it becomes part of you. And that that's knowledge. why the desert is a gift. Okay. So... Where is it that I learn that I'm not the one who can provide for all my needs? In the place where any recourse externally to something other than the one who's the giver of all good things is possible is taken from me. Like desolation can serve as a, a revelatory moment in the journey of the life. The, the spiritual writers talk about these sort of dark nights, but there's, mm -hmm. there's, moments in the providence of God where he lets us go into the desert to teach us that he is the living water and to teach us that he is the bread of life, the manna that's given. And that catechetical lesson, that sort of pedagogy happens again and again throughout the course of life. And it's funny because I've just experienced this, like all these years of following Jesus, and then all of a sudden he he allows us to come to a plateau where I'm like, I feel like I got this man. Like I'm rocking this like discipleship thing, this friar life. I'm a great priest is like, mm -hmm. this is wonderful. And then all of a sudden, like he'll pull back mm -hmm. that grace that was sustaining me and let me just like fall flat on my face mm -hmm. to learn again that, oh yeah, it's you. It's actually always only been you. Jesus, mercy, help me. And then rising again and meeting the eyes of Jesus who always comes to save mm. and not to condemn, as he says in the gospel, I'm filled with hope that, you know what, like as much as I'm sort of like sucking right now at my vocation in life, <laughs> Jesus is here with me to give me what I lack. And the gift of his love through the power of his spirit will do something in me that I can't do for myself. And we, we realize that it's like, I don't know. I mean, you might not have this. I, I just so often fall back into self-reliance and this kind of like thought that somehow I'm like, I'm doing it. And that poverty that Francis, I love that about St. Francis is he was a man who once he discovered the riches of the poverty of Christ remained poor throughout all of his life because he didn't want to lose even the smallest coin that was to be found in those riches. And so he's like, he's okay with his poverty. And he wasn't perfect. It's funny, like even his life, like mm. people think about him as somehow, you know, he has a conversion and then he li li lives this amazing life. Well, the reason towards the end of his life that he ends up on Mount Laverna where the trans where the um, the stigmata happens is because he'd been rejected by his brothers, was depressed, angry, and had become an emotional recluse to the guys around him mm -hmm. because he was suffering and felt like everything he had built was lost and had been taken from him. Well, that's what brings him to the place where stigmata happens. Is that right? But people don't, you know, like, so like we're, we're, you know, we're, we're always in need of like an invitation. And, and it's kind of this thing where like, you know, like in the ascetical life, you can only row so far. Mm -hmm. And then it's got to be the wind that carries you to the place the Lord desires to bring us, which is into the depths. And so my best efforts at conversion, at like fidelity to God, living a pious life, doing the stuff, working on virtue, all those best efforts at some point are just totally not enough. And then comes the gift of God's love, which invites me to the cross. And that cross is what forms in me the heart of Jesus Christ. We've come full circle to the beginning, eh? Because mm. we began by talking about it's one thing to talk about esoteric matters, philosophical mm -hmm. issues, but the person of Christ, eh? And, mm -hmm. and so it's like Christianity, you're saying, it's not like a philosophy that I read about, learn, and then live. Mm. But that's what we sometimes think. And then yeah. you hit a wall and you realize, no, there's a person here who's got yeah. the help. 
And that's where, honestly, kind of is a little bit of a topic shift, but the Eucharistic revival for me uh-huh. is a profound sign of hope in the life of the church because of that very fact. Like there's so many things that are problematic, so many struggles in the life of the church, mm-hmm. in society, um, politically, socially, there's all sorts of different mm-hmm. layers, right? To this sort of sense of chaos and storm. Yeah. And in the midst of that, it's like, where, where am I going to look for the answers to the questions that I don't have? an answer to where am I going to look for solutions to the problems that we can't fix ourselves. And they just seem to be sort of multiplying them, you know, exponentially in the world. It's like, there's only one answer and it's, it is not an answer in the sense of sort of a trite response. It's a person, Jesus Christ. And when you put Jesus in the center, when you return the eyes of the bride to the bridegroom, this is when revival happens. This is when like renewal and transformation happens, falling in love again with Christ, learning again what's in his heart because my heart is oriented to him in the Eucharist, learning what church really means right through the beautiful celebration of the liturgy, Um, Eucharistic adoration, you know, something in the West. It's a big part of our tradition for our faith in the Eucharist. And this putting Jesus at the center, I think, is a, a... it's like a bold statement of faith on the part of the church, which is like, yeah, the ship's sinking. What are we going to do? We're going to pray. We're not going to like fall into the sort of like voices and responses of worldly wisdom and logic. We're going to bow down on our knees before the living God and cry out to him, do what we can't do. Save us. Bring revival. Revival is a participation in the resurrection the revivification of the flesh of Jesus like leads to this revivification of my humanity, but to the bride herself, the church. And so it's like, this is what it's about. It's about Jesus as a person. Do you remember that advertisement for Apple phones? There's an app for that. Do you remember that? And I think we often live like that. You know, our Mm. lives get increasingly complicated and we think that there's a, there's a way out of it that's going to require not a poverty in any other area of my mm. life, but just an addition. I'll keep mm-hmm. adding things and things will mm-hmm. keep, the, they'll, they'll get better. And if they're chaotic, yeah. there's an app for that. And, yeah. um, but like sometimes it's like, yeah, poverty, silence. It's like, no, no, no delete the app. There's, there's yeah. too many things. Go yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Because um, the reason why silence is so powerful is because silence is the expression in my embodied like existence of bending the knee of my very being before the creator. And so I'm here in this posture of absolute dependence, absolute poverty, absolute trust that we don't wait in vain when we wait upon the Lord. Right. And that silence is an expression, right? of this all before who he is mm. and an awareness of who we are both in like my my littleness but also that i've been called into this relationship it's just like wow yeah explore that with me a bit bit more i'd like to understand that silence this is good because Art. you know in a way what came to mind as you were saying that is silence and inactivity when done intentionally mm-hmm. I like an admission that I can't fix this. There's nothing I can add here. Mm-hmm. Is that yeah. kind of what you mean or no? Yeah. And, and also, right, the line that's often quoted, right, from one of the Psalms, um, I, I think it's Psalm 47. I might be wrong about that, but I'm terrible with numbers. I was Sorry. a lit major. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that it says, be still, yeah. right? And we cannot be still and know, and know that I am God. And I think there's sort of like a parentheses that I would put in there that I sort of add for myself. And you're not. Mm. Like know that I'm God and you're not. And know that I'm a God who is love. And so therefore you can rest Mm -hmm. in me. You can be still with me. The whole problem of like the freneticism that exists in the world is in part sort of the, some of it's like a fleeing from that silence, but I also think even this, this sort of uh, the humbling of ourselves as human beings, which is expressed through the observance of the day of rest, the Lord's day has been lost. And we live our lives as if everything was up to us. Mm-hmm. And 
if I do more, produce more, mm -hmm. make more, say more, say more. And the expression of rest that's sort of, if you will, a certain type of stillness in relationship to activity is what the Sabbath is entering into. A posture of like, I'm just going to go play today with my children mm -hmm. and I'm not going to do anything. And that is saying that, you know, why I can do that and not have to worry about whatever might be waiting in my inbox or waiting at work is because guess what? I have a good and loving father. Yeah. I can, he's, yeah. he's going to take care of me. Like yeah. I literally don't have to worry about it. That's not irresponsible. It's actually looking at reality through the lens of the fullness of the truth of who God is and who we are. It's seeing things in their whole context. It's not saying I don't have a massive to-do list. It's saying I have a God who's bigger than my to-do list and who loves me and who said, set that down and come be with me. And that's expressed through the rest of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. But then there is the other aspect is, is like, set this down. <laughs> Stop speaking. I remember part of my own conversion and call to the priesthood and the friar life was, um, was connected with silence. And I remember I was a young adult finishing college. I thought that it was like, you know, I, I had what I would call like my Catholic merit badge sash, you know, it was like, you know, doing morning and evening prayer, liturgy, the hours, praying a daily rosary, most days making it to mass, multiple holy hours a week, youth ministry, mission trips. It was like, I had all this stuff that I was doing, right? And a plan for my life, which was that I was going to be going to grad school at University of Georgia. Go dogs! Come on. Um, there's a lot to root for there these days. <laughs> but all these doors opened up for me to, to go to graduate school. And it was like I got into the right program, got a fellowship, and a good friend of mine was starting simultaneously another program. So I had a roommate at UGA. Everything was set out. It was like red carpet. And somebody who I was talking to was asking me about my plans. And I told them that and then told them, I also hope in my breaks to be able to do mission work. And this friend of mine, she just looks at me and says, well, why don't you forget about school and just go be a missionary? And I was just like, did you not hear? Like there's all these opportunities that are in front of me. And, but I couldn't let go of it. And so I went to adoration <clears throat> and I'm there in front of Jesus. And I start just getting angry about this, like lack of peace about the path I'm on. And I said, God, just, I'm tired. Like I'd been in seminary before this. Okay. I was a seminarian for a year with my diocese, mm. discerned that wasn't it. I thought for a moment, gonna get married. That wasn't it. And I was just in this like limbo land. Like if people have ever done like a lot of discerning, sometimes you just get to the point where you're just like, Which, I'm just done. Like, I'm all right, tired. I'm, I'm tired of trying to figure this out. Yeah. And I'd tell in Jesus, I'm like one of those moments of sincerity. I'm like, dude, would you just tell me? Like, what is it I'm supposed to do in my life? Why are you making it so complicated? Why won't you tell me what your will is? And I just thought, like, you know, you kind of get that out there. <laughs> and then I heard in my heart, the Lord say, you don't know my plan and you don't want to know what I desire for you because you will not listen. And I came back with my Catholic merit badge sash, right? Mm -hmm. And started naming all the things that I did. And the Lord, like so mercifully, and I just, again, this is interior in my heart. I'm not hearing locutions mm -hmm. or whatever. I'm not like a crazy mystic, but in my heart just heard in this moment, Jesus say, you do all of this and you ask me what I want and you tell me what's in your heart, but you will not sit in the silence to listen for my response. And it was just this moment of like every scales falling. And I just realized my spiritual life was so full of me. And there wasn't space for him. And even though it had all the external trappings of awesome Catholic spirituality. And so I just started doing this kind of like deal. I just started going to adoration and I'm like, I'm not taking anything with me. And I'm just going to go sit. And it was really distracting at first and difficult. But in this silence it was a place where all of a sudden I just heard the Lord. It was, it was, it was a couple of months after this of just sitting in silence before the Eucharist. And then just one day in just this place of peace and rest, I just heard Jesus say to me there, if you follow the path you're on, I will bless you and be with you. But if you do not, I have something better for you. And it was like this peace and joy. And I'm like, this is, this is like, I've been waiting, Lord, just to like hear you. And when you hear his voice, whew, 
When you hear the voice of Jesus, your heart knows it. It knows it because we're meant to hear the voice of a good shepherd. Mm -hmm. And it just like set me free interiorly and gave me this joy. And I'm like, all right, Lord, what do you got? And there was, there was radio silence. (laughs) Like all I knew was he said, let go of all this. And then, you know, got something better. And it left me in a moment of like, all right, Lord, what do I do? And so I, I, I just said, all right, like after wrestling, talking to my spiritual director, I was like, I know that was him. And I don't know what it means, but I'm, I've, I've got to follow that voice. And that voice was only something I ever was able to hear in silence. And, and it was a few mm-hmm. months later on a silent retreat at a, a monastery of Trappist, Mepkin Abbey down in South Carolina, where three days of silence, not just a holy hour, but now three days of silence and in nature where I've always loved to meet Jesus. Um, there was again a revelation in my heart where in that stillness and rest, the Lord just showed me that amidst many desires, the thing that my heart wanted most was to just live for him. And I was like, sweet, let's do it. Come on. <laughs> and, and that was the fruit of silence. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the world, right? There's so many ways in which like we're filled with so much noise, but, yeah. but that silence is, is, it's, can be frightening and it's a poverty, but there is the place where I discover, right? Um, the truth of who I am, right? One is I am a poor beggar. Mm-hmm. That's the first movement. Mass starts, the liturgy starts that way. I'm a sinner. I come in this way, but then what happens? God himself addresses himself to me as a creature, which means I'm calling you into a relationship, but we don't get to hear that invitation without staying in the poverty of that silence. But in that place, man, when he speaks, yo, <laughs> this is what changes history, changes reality. Like, so, silence is similar to suffering in, mm. in that it's, it, if it's done well, it's receptive, eh? Because mm-hmm. I, I like to tell the Lord, here's my plan of life. Here's the things that I'll do mm-hmm. for you. I'll pray this prayer and I'll do this thing. And mm-hmm. all of that's beautiful. And it's almost like the Lord is doing something to me through suffering while I'm coming up with my own plan. And I'm trying to bat that away so I can get about <laughs> the business of becoming holy. Absolutely. <laughs> as opposed to turning around and trying to receive that with his grace, mm-hmm. receive that suffering. It's almost like he speaks to us in that poverty of silence, but also the poverty of suffering. Oh yeah. And I don't like that at all. Yeah. One thing I don't like is when the Lord tells you to wait. I like when he says yes. I don't mm-hmm. like it when he says no. I hate it. When you mm. just get the sense, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Wait. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. There's a psalm that says, in silence and in rest lies your strength. Okay. I've just been, it's, I think that I, I read, I was reading recently that wonderful little book, um, Searching for and Maintaining Peace oh, yeah. by Father Jacques Philippe. And I believe, incredible. I believe that's quoted within that. Mm-hmm. This is such an important point that yeah. the Lord desires us to have peace. Yeah. And that often we think that the spiritual battle is about something else when often the spiritual battle is about maintaining our peace so that we can see clearly. Mm-hmm. What do you say to people, though, who are listening and think, well, easy for you to say, Father, you don't have children. You might have loud mm-hmm. music outside your window, but you've got <laughs> structured time for prayers that you're made to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got to work two jobs or I've got this many children and life's hard, man. Like, mm-hmm. how? what do I do? What do I do to carve out time for for, for peace, for rest, for quiet Yeah, in, in a busy kind of life? And I th- Maybe they're letting themselves off the hook. Maybe they don't realize just how full your life is, right? But Yeah. I mean, it's there are days, right, where like I show up to holy hour and I'm like, oh my goodness, because I was doing some ministry or working and doing some, I didn't pray my daytime prayer yet. You know, like I know that sounds small, but like for religious where my life is built around this life of prayer, it's like things happen. And, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes you have to really like look at like what's the greater good here. And, and not to judge people, but just to say like, okay, what am I really looking for? What is prayer? Prayer is my heart encountering the heart of Jesus, which is a revelation of the heart of the Father in the power of the Spirit. And so if that's what it is, I can pray anywhere and anytime. Now, I get it. You got kids screaming. It's like, I'm about to go nuts right now, right? Um, but St. Francis said this. He said, I will make my heart my hermitage. Mm. And he was torn between like living a more like aromatical life and like being with people. What and, does that word mean, aromatical? 
Air medical. So it's it, it comes from sort of a, a way of life that's going into the desert and having a life of solitude and prayer. Um, and, and so the air medical life would be, uh, a more contemplative life, a life that's maybe lived in a hermitage apart. Yeah. You can think of the guy who's in a, you know, like a little hut in yeah. a mountain. Anthony wooded area. Egypt or, yeah. 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 So, um, there's different forms of it, mm. but at its heart, it's this contemplative life of separating oneself into a place sure. of silence okay. in the East. You would have like kind of pustinia yeah. would be an expression of that. Um, so, so this air medical life is like. He's like, I'm going to make my heart my mm, hermitage. Mm. And I do think it's possible. And, and I think one thing I tell people first off is, is like to just take stock of my life and just ask myself, um, where are there things that I'm doing by myself that I could start doing with Jesus? Mm-hmm. So I'm doing laundry by myself. Mm-hmm. I could do laundry with Jesus. And I'm a mom, and guess what? The laundry never ends. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm working and I'm involved with my work. I'm a husband. I'm providing for my family. It's like, and I and you know, like I was a carpenter before I was a friar. Mm-hmm. And like one of the one of the things is like I realized at work, like one of the places that I was able to just be alone, even though I was around people, was when I was working on a table saw. Mm. So you're totally focused. Nobody's going to bother you. Um, sometimes you have ear gear on it and, and you're just, you're cutting wood mm-hmm. and you're just doing this activity to which you're very attentive. Totally. Lest you cut your thumb off. Right? Uh, yeah, so it absolutely. has to be a very specific yeah. but mindful. I, but I realized that Lord, you're here. And so the, all of a sudden like cutting on the table saw became a place where as I'm pushing this through. I'm like asking Jesus, please don't let me cut my fingers off. But I'm also just like, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I pray in tongues, you know, and ask the Holy Spirit to come. It was a moment of encounter that was in the midst of the activity of, you know, Mm. building a house, (laughs) you know. Um, So I think there are places in our lives where we're doing things alone and Jesus is wanting to meet us there. And that's something that it doesn't matter what my life is and what it looks like. I can begin to just ask that question, Lord, where is there something I'm doing alone that you want to do with me? Because my heart meets you, I'm praying, even if I'm not on my knees in the adoration chapel. And that might not be a real possibility for somebody for seasons of life, you know? Got a lot of friends with a lot of kids, you know, I'm the second of eight in my family. It's like, sometimes you have to like, ask yourself like, what does holiness look like now at this moment? My wife once gave advice to a new mother who was upset about the fact that she could no longer go to adoration and pray the way she used to. And she was like, she's like, sister, your, 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 your holy hour, it's two in the morning when you're breastfeeding your child. You know? mm. She's a much wiser woman than I yeah. am. Man. Yeah. <laughs> she's a good woman. Yeah. It'd be awkward if you said that too, anyhow. What's that? I said it'd be awkward if you said that too, anyhow. <laughs> if I said what? The, the advice about the two in the morning. Uh, yes, that would be very <laughs> awkward. Yeah, no, she's, she's so good and... Mm. It's almost like it takes as much faith to believe that the sufferings we're encountering are from the Lord and that he'll bring all to good than it takes to believe that that wafer is the second person of the blessed Trinity. You know, Mm. it's like it does take faith. It does. Or the faith that I can do this with Jesus. I can do the laundry with Jesus. I can. Well, St. Francis had insight to that. Insight? Insight to that. And and it was, uh, he he writes, there's a, a series of, exhortations he gave to his brothers called the admonition. So okay. amongst his writings and the Let's first admonition has everything to do with the body of Christ. Literally, it's sort of like reverence for the body of Christ. He's talking about receiving the Eucharist and the way that we receive the Eucharist and faith in the Eucharist. What and he, he has, say? has a beautiful yeah. insight where he says that it is impossible to discern the reality that is before us, except in the spirit. And then he goes on to make a comment, which just like opens up a window of like understanding. He says, the disciples were only able to discern the word of God made flesh in Jesus when he walked among them because the Holy Spirit revealed it to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And similarly, it is only the Holy Spirit who can reveal to us the truth Mm -hmm. of who is present in the Eucharist. And the same, I believe this is like Blaise Pascal. I think he's, no, yeah, Pascal said something like that, that 
Oh, it, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but some see some saw Christ and believed him only to be a man. Mm -hmm. Some saw some saw the Eucharist or see the Eucharist and believe it to be bread. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, and it's so clear, like yeah, right, like just tradition. The fathers regard to like this is no mere bread, right? Um, but the same struggle that there is with faith in the Eucharist is the same struggle we encounter when we look at suffering. The same struggle that I encounter when I'm in my concrete struggle in my marriage right now. And it's like, how is that? Where are you here, God? Um, and it's all tied to and originates in this mystery of the incarnation, which is a passion and an obsession for St. Francis, mm -hmm. which is that God is so near, so humble that he comes to us in this way, but to believe that this could be true that this is actually like that this little, you know, and we're so... Um, Being removed from it is easier in some ways, I think. Yeah. Like if I was walking around with Jesus and he's like, hey, I'm just going to hit head and I'll be back. I'd be like, there's no way that's... the What? Yeah. That's not God. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, you think about it, it's like even Our Lady, right? Who, perfect faith, perfect woman. It's like there was an ongoing exercise of the gift and grace of faith that she's making before the mystery of this child that she's raising and seeing in the intimacy of the home. And it's like, that is way too, you know, like dirty diaper, like yeah. son of God. Mm, really? Are you, I mean, I know that something happened and I don't know how to explain it, but is that, that's you. You're this close. You're this real. You're yeah. this intimate and present and, and also, right, I think the same thing happens with the cross. It's the disciples who stand in the face of that moment where it's like, okay, like we're totally cool with you healing people, raising the dead, multiplying. Love Love Let's it. do that. Let's hit the repeat. Come on, go. And, you know, like Lazarus, come out. But the cross, the apparent failure in the eyes of the world, suffering, mm. mockery, shame, you know, it's like nakedness all powerlessness and and the standards that the world puts before us like all of that's like whoa that's way too close but here's the thing is is if jesus is not truly god and truly there in that place on the cross of the depths of human suffering darkness evil rejection and death then when i'm there i'm alone mm -hmm. and i think worse than any suffering and i've worked a lot with hospital ministry prison ministry and just pastoral ministry as a friar with the poor. And one of the most tremendous sufferings that human beings ever can know is feeling alone in their suffering. Yeah, The pain itself is real and it's not to negate or to sort of mm -hmm. downplay, but the worst experience is that I'm here, I'm alone, no one sees, no one knows, no one understands, no one cares. And the fact of Jesus coming into that space, allowing all of a sudden like this to be a point, not of isolation and loneliness, but a place of communion transforms from the inside. Right. But like that, that's you doing that, Jesus, like that takes faith, but that's not something that we can conjure up. And I just, you know, like, it's not like I just got to believe more, you know, this is a gift. And if faith is a gift, and it's something that's given to us, this revelation is given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, then I encourage people, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to the truth, the reality of what's before me, whether it's in the Eucharist or in the suffering that I'm facing in my life mm -hmm. or the crisis in my marriage or my own struggles of my sin that I just can't break out of. Like, Holy Spirit, give me eyes to see. And again, like when you meet him there and you see him, everything changes and it's not something I can explain with words, mm. but this reality who is a person who has a name, Jesus Christ, when you meet him transforms everything. And all of a sudden, like just this wafer deal becomes the most profound, humble act of self gift that the father makes to us in an ongoing way and the body, blood, soul, and divinity of his son in the Eucharist, you know? And suffering becomes not meaningless, but this sort of like powerhouse, you know, this, this source of tremendous grace because it's a source of intimate communion with Jesus on the cross. Um, and all these places are at moments of like communion, like Jesus is there waiting for us. Like, it's kind of the crazy thing about the incarnation is like, yo, like the entire cosmos was just like, 
transformed. Mm -hmm. I remember being in the Holy Land, walking up the steps to the beautiful gate that we hear about in the gospel and like sitting on these stones when they're like, there's no doubt that these stones are the original steps that would have been here at the time of Jesus. So my man walked in and out of this gate and I'm just sitting there and I'm just like, what would it have, like, what did creation think with like every step, the creator just like being, just like radiating out every step up. He's just like, whoa, everything changed with the incarnation. <laughs> mm. And and that's the good news, right? This is the gospel that we preach. Um, I, I wanted to go back in order to move forward to what we were talking about a moment ago about the friars of the renewal and mm -hmm. the kind of the the foundational story or the the myth i don't mean that in the false sense but there's a story y'all have which you tell mm -hmm. yourself which sustains and directs who you are as friars yeah. right you enjoy i'm sure talking about the origins of mm -hmm. the friars of the renewal and what it was like and mm -hmm. what happened and like that story sort of grounds you and gives you identity and yeah to make to give a secular example, I think this group called the Daily Wire do mm. a really good job at that as well. You know, uh, mm. Caleb and Ben and the other fellow whose name I'm forgetting. They they talk about how it all began, mm. and it seems like that story grounds them, guides them as people come into the fold of their business. Mm. It orients them in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the kind of point I'm making, and that's that we individually, it seems to me, have to know our mythos story. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't have a story about who we are and what we're about, everyone around, around us is going to try to give us our story. Yeah. So it's almost like you have to define who you are so as not to be defined by mm -hmm. the demon, by the demonic, by the world. Yep. You know, some of us grow up in families and there's a story about that kid. Yeah. You know, like I, when I met my wife, you know, mm -hmm. I, I realized that there was a story about the kind of person she was within her family. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be like, oh, my love. No, that's not you. Mm -hmm. Like, that's too limited. You're you're this, you know, mm -hmm. um, or you're the black sheep of the family or this. Yeah. Like, there's stories. Right. And I just think it's really important mm -hmm. that we know that we are the beloved of God and we keep coming back to our story because what will the world say to us, right? You're, you're, you're good in as far as you are useful mm -hmm. or beautiful mm -hmm. uh, or smart or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then when you don't measure up to that, the shame that comes from that, but mm -hmm. the importance of sitting before the Lord and letting him tell us who, who we are. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I, I, I did a, um, in seminary, a thesis on the Catholic response to the gender ideology mm. issue and just had an opportunity to just deep dive on the topic, but most importantly, and what was the greatest gift was hearing the stories of a number of different um, Catholics who experienced <coughs> gender identity, discordance, mm -hmm. dysphoria, and who are seeking to try and follow the Lord in the midst of that experience. And mm -hmm. I recognize this, awesome. like this, that part of the struggle for humanity, right, is that loss of the sense of identity and this question that Jesus asked, right, I think is the one that he wants us to ask him. So this question he asked in Matthew 16, where he mm. says, who do you say that I am mm -hmm. to the disciples? Mm -hmm. And I and I just was praying with it and thinking about these brothers and sisters. And I was like, oh, he wants us to ask him that question. That's good. Yeah. He wouldn't ask a question that would be then unfair to turn it around. Yeah. Like, hey, real quick, real quick. Yeah. You see, as the conversation ended and the Jesus and the disciples, yeah. hey, real quick, just quick, who do you say who I am? Yeah. Like, can you, you I know, like and, that. and in the story that, that, that we need to know is the one that Jesus reveals to us mm -hmm. about who we are yeah. in the, in the letter to the Ephesians. Yeah. Like, I'm not even who I say I am. Yeah. Well, this is one Isn't of the things cool? like, yeah, like <laughs> the, the human heart, Jeremiah says, the human heart yeah. is something that is a mystery. It's torturous. Who can mm -hmm. understand it? God mm -hmm. alone. And so right. this like, that includes my own heart. Like it's something that we, we talk about, like in the culture, like, you know, I'm like, I'm going to define who I am. I'm going to follow my heart. I am going to sort of write my own story. I'm sort of this self-creating autonomous being in the world that can be whatever I want. But the reality is, is if I'm really honest, I don't even know myself fully. There's something inside me that's like a mystery inside of me. Because I'm not a good enough Catholic. I have to yeah. look up these verses from time <laughs> to time. First John 3.20, if our hearts condemn us, 
We know that God is greater than our hearts, and He knows everything. Mm. Mm. So I'm not. Amen. And I don't know if it, yeah, I know Saint Francis as well as G.K. Chesterton, Mother Teresa, are the place that all unattributed quotes go to die. And so I don't know <laughs> if this is from Francis or not. But somebody yeah. said, "We are who we are before Him, and nothing else." That is actually Francis. It's in his writings. Okay. So you're golden Good, on I'm that one. Yeah, we don't yeah. have to throw that one in the yeah. trash bin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but that's that's what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Who? Eh? You, so it's in one of his admonitions, actually. Those okay. the, those exhortations. I was talking about, and it's actually, he's writing against kind of hubris and pride and sort of vainglory mm. and this kind of attempt to define ourselves. And it's, he's so real, it's hilarious. He's like, even if you were a good speaker, even if you were super intellectual, even if you were very attractive and he goes he through all this, the, he's, yeah, he's writing to his brothers. He's I like, you're all that. these things. He's like, he's like, none of this you could claim for your own. He says, the only thing we can claim, right, is our, our poverty and our sin. And then, <laughs> right. and then he says, and then he goes on, right? And he says, what a man is in the eyes of God, that he is and nothing more. Mm. And what that is, is loved. Yeah. Dependent. Yes. And loved in a way that we're even like unwilling to accept. Mm. Like we fight that kind of unconditional love. We want to be like, but yeah, I want to be respected. Not yeah. Loved. yeah. And, and I want to prove that I'm worth it. And it was yeah. like, no, like actually my love is what makes you worthy. Yeah. It's not that you're worthy and therefore you're loved. Yeah. And this is like Ephesians reveals as chapter one, you find this phrase. It just like struck me. It was like before the foundation of the world, depending on the translation or creation of the heavens and the earth, you were chosen in Christ for holiness and destined in love to be a child of God. Well, if it's before the flip and foundation of the world, guess who had nothing to do with it? <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> this, guy. this guy, right? It's like, no way. Like, it's like, so, so I think that that's something that we have to like relinquish this false idea of the self-made man. That's kind of this inherent um, yeah. heresy of American pragmatism, I would call it. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is something that we have to let go of in order to receive a much greater truth, yeah. which is that the Lord himself has made us worthy and digno. I just said it in Spanish. Sorry. I was like worthy of his love, um, by the virtue of the fact that he loves us. It's this mystery where like, he has said I'm worthy because he's created me in such a way that I'm capable of receiving his love. And he has offered that love in its totality as a free gift to me through Jesus Christ, who in order to be able to receive it has offered his life on the cross. And my part is to do what? To receive. Will I receive the gift? That's kind of like the question. And in receiving the gift, I receive the truth of my identity, going back to story and like knowing where we're from. Mm. It's like, if I know that my, my ultimate origin story, right, is is the heart of the father, mm. which is poured out into creation through his son and the power of the spirit. If I know that that's the ultimate origin story, like I'm the fruit of love. JP two says something beautiful. He says that the origin of everything that exists, we don't find so much a great mind as we find a great heart. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is my ultimate. And so like my identity coming back to that, right? Yeah. And then knowing also, I think salvation history is important. The ignorance of the story of salvation that's present in the world today because people haven't heard it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm thinking of Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, the accuser who accused them day and mm -hmm. night before the throne of God. Like, well, yeah. I want to know what those accusations were. Mm -hmm. But if we don't listen to the Father, we've got other voices speaking yeah. to us. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Do you know what is cast out? The accuser of brethren is cast out right. by the blood of the lamb. Okay. So the blood of the lamb cast him out. Yeah. And the testimony That's right. of, of the believers. Okay. This is interesting. That's so good. it's like, it's the blood of the lamb and the testimony. So there is a, so how is he cast out? And this is where coming back to like w being rooted in who I am in Christ allows me to testify in the face of that accusation against it with the truth. Mm -hmm. It's like your sin is who you are. You're, a, you're, you're, you're somebody who's, who's a screw up, who's a failure, who's a sinner, who's a horrible person, who's no one sees, no one loves, whatever it is. Um, yeah, or it even is. the positive things I want to put on myself, right? right? Oh, you're successful. You're a great businessman. You're yeah. a really good speaker. You're a really good athlete. 
all of that like really is and that not goes away it does so here's what it says then i heard a loud cr- loud voice in heaven say now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our god and the authority of his messiah amen for the come accuser on. of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our god mm. what a prick day and yep. night has been hurled down they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Praise God, eh? Come on. The authority. Do you, what's, what's, what's the, um, I mean, the people around your monastery, your uh, friaries must, mm-hmm. must know of you. Yeah. So I'm sure there are obviously parts of New York where you'd be strange looking, mm-hmm. but I'm sure, you know, within a circumference of these different oh, friaries, yeah. people get to know you. Yeah. What's, there is, there's beautiful. I pulled up. So, I mean, Unfortunately, right, homelessness is a reality and, and seems to have grown in recent years across the country. So there's very often at intersections, people begging. Mm-hmm. But I love the fact that I pull up to the intersection and the guy's coming asking and he sees me and he knows he's not going to get anything from me because he knows the friars. Mm-hmm. But I go up and I'm like, hey, how you doing? I was like, hey, brother. He's like, good to see you, man. As I listen. He was like, I'm going into rehab tomorrow. Pray for me, okay? Mm-hmm. You know, and it was just like this. And I, and I pray for him and give him a blessing, ask him what his name is and offer up a prayer for this guy. You know, it's like I'm walking around in the neighborhood in the South Bronx and yeah. you've got all these people that are like, you know, total like hood gangster or whatever. And they're hanging out in the corner and and you come by and and there's there's a recognition. It was like, hey, bro, you know, or thank, thanks for what you do. We yeah, have, a, I, I we have bet, a food hand now. We have a homeless shelter right. or youth program. I was going to say, I bet the uh, who the friars are spreads, right? Yeah. So when you first encounter them, who knows who they are? But if you oh, learn man, that first they're helping, <laughs> they're helping your neighbors, they're helping your loved ones. Yeah, I remember being in Patterson, New Jersey. I helped found the friary. Okay. And so we're wandering in this neighborhood that's like ground zero for meth at that time, like the movement corridor up into the Northeast. So it's like lots of violence. Lots of horrible things going on, lots of dealers and pretty big gang wars that were part of that area. And we're just like wandering around, you know, like here I am, you know, like bearded white dude in in the neighborhood. Um, and like somebody coming up is like, hey, man, I don't know what you're up to, bro, but this ain't a neighborhood you should be in. And I was like, I was like, actually, I was like, we live here. We just moved in. <laughs> so, hey, neighbor. <laughs> how you doing? You know, howdy. Um, but after a little bit, like of walking in that neighborhood at first there was like you know i remember there were some people that were sitting on their stoops and they're like what are you doing here you know and you just kind of talk to them again in a way that people are able to receive begin to were you afraid at the beginning walking through places like that i've only been afraid once in my life as a friar and it was never in any place in the u.s it was in a prison in nicaragua where i was a missionary we gotta go there now (laughs) gotta go what happened so i'm there and we're prison chaplains and this prison is built for roughly 900 um, inmates, and there's about 3,000 that are in it. Oh my and it man. looks much more, it's a horrible situation. And pray for Nicaragua, mm-hmm. and especially for um, Bishop Rolando Alvarez, who's in prison, condemned for 28 years, a bishop there, um, for, for standing up for the faith. Um, Against who? The communists? Uh, the, yeah, the government that's there in power. So... Um, was he given an option to recant, to leave? How did yeah, that... he could have left the country, but he said, I'm not going to leave my flock. Wow. And even if so is Catholicism in... now illegal in Nicaragua? It is not entirely illegal. What's illegal is to speak against the government in any way. Uh-huh. And the church was one of those voices there that was God that was speaking him. out against things that were happening, injustices, et cetera. Okay. Okay. And so because he was unwilling to be silent... In the face of injustice, um, they they arrested him. There was other priests that were exiled as a result of that. So, like the prisons down there are not. I'm like, I'm, this is not any. Nobody wants to go to prison there. Period. Um, and this prison where we were chaplains wasn't where he had, he went to a political prison, but the one we went to. So was you were just saying it's made for 900, 900 and about three thousand inmates. Yeah. So what does each cell look like? How there aren't people? cells. It's like I mean, it looks more like what I would expect like Auschwitz or something, meaning like barracks that are just stacked like, you know, cordwood. You got people on like three high, you know, just shoved in and there's like a tiny corridor in the center where you can walk. 
Um, oh there's goodness. nothing growing inside there. No trees. It's just like dirt and kind of little tufts of brown grass. Oh my gosh. And, you know, and a lot of violence, a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a rough place. And we were chaplains there. Okay. You, I'm which sorry. Was, this story is too good. I need you to slow down. So you went to Nicaragua. Yeah. And then tell us about the first time you were told that this is what you'd be doing and what it was like stepping foot in there. Um, so I was basically, I was in my temporary vows and I was told you're going to go with our priest who's going to celebrate mass. Uh -huh. And then eventually you're going to take over as being kind of the chaplain <laughs> who's doing catechesis and working with guys inside the prison, including what's, the, what's in, what's in, uh, internal security like there. Um, well, this is what, okay. this is what was kind of a little bit disconcerting to me was, is you go in and the guards and, you know, I mean, to be honest, it's like a lot of the guards are just people that have jobs and they work there and that's their thing. Um, but we go in and they walk with you and take you through these different lock gates, lock gates, and they're closing them behind you. And then there's a large room that's just open. It's got like burn marks or smoke on the walls. It's a corrugated um, roof that's made out of, um, what's that stuff that's illegal that'll give you cancer? Uh, asbestos. asbestos, there we go. So asbestos, like old school asbestos that have holes that are pocked in it. So little yeah. beads of light, there's no light in there except for some windows that are high up on the wall that are like with the great, you know, the, the metal bars. And we're there to celebrate mass with the people that are in there. And there's just all these different people in there. We go in and I'm like looking around and like a lot of shady looking characters. And the prison guards walk us in there, we come in, and then he just like closes the thing behind me, locks it and just walks away. And I'm just like, okay. All right. No guidance, no suggestions. Yeah, no, and no security. And no security. I'm just in this room with like 150 prisoners, many of whom are there for like, you know, taking human life, literally, um, without any judgment, just facts, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and some of them are looking like, I would love to just like skin you alive right now kind of vibes. And so I'm trying and to be- you and somebody else? Or? There's a priest who's there as well. Yeah, you One and the, the priest. Yeah, there. so um, I believe it was Father Albert. And so we're there and he starts setting up for mass and he's like, you know, um, he was like, you know, help out with this. And he was like, okay. And I just want you to sit with the people and try and, you know, invite people to participate by participating, doing responses and things like that. And they had a group of guys who were doing music, which was awesome. They had guitarron and the guitar, and it was like a little bit like a mariachi type of group that were doing music. They were prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's like a group of guys that are there. And I remember like I walked back and they're lining the wall and they're just like all tatted to pieces, you know? So it was like definitely gang, gang related guys. And I tried to be like a cheery boy from Georgia who's like, hey, how you doing? You know, it's going like, how y'all, yeah. you know, come on, we're doing mass. This is going to be awesome. And um, saying all this in Spanish, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and one of the guys just all of a sudden just like looks at me and just like death in his eyes and just like cranks up his middle fingers and give me two middle fingers just like Poof. and then he just goes and i'm just like <laughs> and i'm looking around i'm like oh my God. And it was like i mean i was like oh man like this dude doesn't care about anything and mm -hmm. could very well like kill me right now it was it was a moment of just like yeah. so i just turned around i was like stop you in you just know it's walking, like we could just, just keep, keep walking <laughs> And went back and got closer to the altar and was there for the rest of mass. And like nothing happened in that moment with this, but it was like, yeah, could have, could have. And this guy was like this type of situation where it's like, he had nothing to lose right. if he did something to me. Yeah, He's already in prison, multiple sentences, people going to prison there and sometimes they just never come out. Um, but one of the neat things about that same sort of scenario was, is flash forward like six months later, and working with some of the men in the prison, we were able to do this retreat. And and there was these guys that went to confession for the first time in years. And these guys that received communion for the first time in years. And you could just see the joy and the light in their eyes mm. of being able to find that even in that place, like Christ was there and he was there for them and he wasn't there to condemn, but to save. Mm -hmm. And like the grace of redemption, the power of Christ. And there was fires lit in their hearts that even though I left and came back almost seven years after that, um, th 
those same men were leaders in the prison evangelizing, set on fire inside mm-hmm. this real, like, just dark situation, right? Um, and for me, I love it because it's like, all right, there is absolutely nothing externally that can explain what's happening here in these men's lives. Mm-hmm. Cause like everything around them, the culture of their life, it's like the joy that they had, the peace and this love and desire to share the gospel inside the prison. It was just like, whoa, man. It's just like a joy to, to see the truth of the gospel manifest mm-hmm. in such a concrete mm-hmm. way. I gotta tell you guys about my new favorite app. It's called Ascension and it's by Ascension Press. This is the number one Bible study app in my opinion. And uh, you can go to ascensionpress.com slash frad, go there. Uh, and so that way they know that we sent you. It is absolutely fantastic. It has the entire Bible there, very well laid out. The, the whole Bible is read to you by Father Mike Schmidt, so just sections of the Bible. It has the catechism there. It's cross-referenced absolutely beautifully. It's really actually quite difficult to explain to you how good this is. Just download it and check it out for yourself. It even has over 1,600 frequently asked questions about Scripture. So if you go to Genesis 1, you might have a question about evolution. Well, there's a drop-down right there. You can read an article article that'll help you understand it. Um, I went through it with the guys at Ascension the other day and my mouth, my jaw was just, it had, it was dropped. It was absolutely amazing. Um, it's had tens of thousands of five-star reviews. Again, go to ascensionpress.com slash frad. It also has all of their amazing Bible studies. So I remember back in the day I had a big DVD case of Jeff Caven's Bible studies. Well, it's all there on the app. So go download it right now. Please go to ascensionpress.com slash frad. Father. <clears throat> Great to have you back. St. Let's, Francis let's do it. CC. Yeah, so you've got a few relics there. This is. I'll tell you how I got my first relic. I was speaking at a church somewhere, mm-hmm. and a priest came up to me and went, I just received this big parcel of relics. And I went, give me one. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, ha. oh, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, so he gave me one. That's awesome. Like, it's not fair that all these priests yeah. have them, but I don't. I got my first one by stealing it. So. Oh, tell me. <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> well, I mean, my patron saint is St. Malachi of Armagh, a very obscure as far as general St. Marty Arlegi, you know, history mm-hmm. goes. Um, saint who showed up in a general donation of relics to one of our friaries. I saw it, you know, I mean, I guess technically it's maybe stealing in a friar sense, but I saw it and I was like, what the heck? I was like, am I ever going to see a St. Malachi's like, you know, like relic again? That's wild. And um, so I asked somebody who wasn't necessarily the superior of the house. I was like, what you, can I just take this? He was like, yeah, don't worry about that. So I like five finger discounted, Double put permission. it in my bag, got it right here, bam. So this is the one that, as I mentioned before the show, is the cleanest relic um, that did. I know because, forgive me, St. Malachi, I am forgetful. And it was in my habit when it went into the wash. Yeah. And it was it was definitely a real relic because the piece <laughs> the of stamps the stamps on the back. Well, the piece of the flesh, there is a stamp on the back too, but the piece of the flesh that was in there, there's papers with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, didn't disappear in the wash. So it wasn't like some kind of. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's still there. St. Malachi, pray well, for us. I have a similar story, but I'm, I did something worse than you did. Oh, and, no. and I'm ashamed of it. And, but like St. Francis, I'm going to admit to my guilt publicly. There we go. Put it out there. So I was somewhere. And somebody offered me a first-class relic of Padre Pio. Wow. And just like this, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yes, please. So, I had to fly home. And so, I wrapped it up in bubble wrap and put it in my backpack. And when I got home, it wasn't there anymore. Like, inside the glass, I couldn't see the fragment of bone yeah. on the thing. I'm really, I'm really embarrassed about this. So, I, I feel sick just telling you what I did. Okay. But so, I thought, well, what am I going to do? I have the paperwork. It's sealed. I opened it up. I opened up the seal. You broke the seal, I bro. I broke the seal. Automatic. I maybe it's not there. I need to know. And that's really weird. Breaking a seal and then think, going, I think this is part of Padre Pio's bone. Yeah. But now I've lost all credibility because the seal's gone. Could have been part of my bone. Maybe I replaced Ooh. it. So that was I was sad about that. There's a there's a now, priest friend of mine who actually said there's someone you can send things to. I don't know exactly. See, the that guy's would have been name. really good to know. I know. I should check it. Father Jake. He's down now. In this Georgia. one here inside of that reliquary is is Thomas Aquinas. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking it'd be lovely to have a first class relic of Thomas mm-hmm. Aquinas. And I said to Scott Hahn, "Do you know where?" I could get a first-class relic of Thomas Aquinas. He said, I wouldn't trust the man who gave it to you. 
<laughs> who, who would ever give up a first class relic? Yeah. Well, I had my mate Bob Lesnevsky come over to the house. He said, I got a gift for you. I said, mm. All right. And it was in an envelope. And it was, of course, this kind of reliquary, this small circle. Mm. And I had no idea what it was. Even holding it, I, mm. I thought it was a bottle cap. <laughs> I thought maybe it's a beer bottle cap from a beer in Australia. And I was just so moved when I saw mm. what it was. I guess wow. an Orthodox priest who watches pints on the on the down on the DL. <laughs> yeah, gave it to him to give to me. So thank you to that Orthodox priest. God bless him. That's but awesome. What, what else do you have? So I also have um, St. Francis of Assisi, a piece of his Praise habit. the Lord. Praise so, him. Now this one actually is quite beautiful. Um talk about just kind of providential moments. So yeah. I was, I don't know if you've traveled much in the last like year, year and a half. But, I have. But and the general situation out there with airlines, cancellations, it's brutal. delays. Isn't it brutal? Dude, I mean like I've been stranded so many places. So and many just pilots wait. and Yeah, air, it's like we're here waiting for time, this think. crew to show up from this flight. Yeah. So I was out in, I believe this was, was it Albuquerque or Denver? Anyhow, I was out Albuquerque, Denver, somewhere out there west. And I got stuck. There was a delay because this flight wasn't, arrived yet and our crew needed to come from this flight to get on our plane which was sitting there at the gate mm -hmm. and they told us you know we're so sorry you're gonna have a delay maybe an hour and a half from now so i'm like man so i'm frustrated a little bit right and so i start walking around just kind of a little bit annoyed and then there was a moment where i just realized i was like okay god like nothing happens by accident you have me here right now if there's anything you want me to do like i'm just open and so i just pulled out my rosary stood up kind of in a more visible way and just kind of pacing. And it was a little bit of a thorough way between a couple terminals. And I'm sitting there just praying my rosary, open to whatever the Lord might want. And then all of a sudden this um, Middle Eastern looking gentleman like walks like straight up to me and he's like, hello, Father. And I'm like, look, <laughs> I'm like, hello, how are you? You know, and I'm like, Father Malachi, Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. And we start chatting and this man was just getting ready to go to the Holy Land with his family on pilgrimage. It's from Lebanon, um, so Maronite, right? Mm -hmm. And we start having this beautiful conversation. And he's like, oh, Father, he was like, you know, I have some, you know, I have some some things with me. Would you bless them? And so he pulls out. He's got like loads of like rosaries and holy medals and all this stuff. So I bless everything that he's got. And then his family comes over. And I was like, well, why don't I give your family a blessing? It was just beautiful. Like we're here in the airport just praying over the family, asking the Holy Spirit to give them all the gifts they need and especially for their pilgrimage to the Holy Land. <coughs> and then he says, Father, I really think God wants me to give you this. And he pulls out a relic of St. Francis of Assisi's and you're like, have I, it. And I, I'm just I sitting concur. here. This is I'm exactly like, this what the Lord wants. This is definitely the will of God. <laughs> Amazing. And so check this out. All right. So like who carries around a relic of like St. Francis's like habit in your like bag while you're traveling? I'm like, who is? I mean, obviously uber Catholic. Let's just get that straight, man. Yeah, yeah. But uh, a beautiful, faithful man, he pulls it out and he was like, oh, yeah. And here's the paperwork. Like, not just like, oh, this might be, it looks old. It's got dust on it, you know, so obviously it's old. Yeah, who carries around the paper? paperwork for the relic? And he gives them both to me. And I'm sitting here and he's like, you know, thank you so much. We're so grateful for this blessing. I just feel like this is just What like does your the, face look like at this moment? My face is just like, <laughs> I, 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 thank, thank you. Like, I'm just like sitting here just looking at, and I'm just like filled with this like sense of, Man, like if I had just sat there angry in my chair, like, you know, just like annoyed that I was waiting for an hour and a half, it's never what happened. Mm -hmm. I stood up, I walked out into a place, made myself visible and just said, God, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, so St. Francis came seeking me and I mean, he's been seeking me for a long time. I mean, obviously I'm dressed like this, so it's like, you know, Franciscan. But um, Francis was really, I think, the nose, uh, the, the camel nose under the tent for me mm, to become Christian. Mm, At World Youth Day 2000. That's right. I went agnostic, not really caring, but, mm -hmm. but intrigued by these happy Christian young people. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in a CC and hearing his story. I almost felt to myself at the time mm. that if... Christ had never have come, I would have perhaps made a religion around St. Francis. I was so enamored by him, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, I can totally relate. Tell us about Francis. Yeah. Who was, I mean, who was he? Wow. 
So I think at the heart of it for me, like, right, like St. Francis is a man who met the Lord. I know that sounds kind of a simple answer, but he was this young guy who comes from a wealthy family, Northern Italy at this like very unstable time and just like history of the world. It's the transition mm-hmm. between like feudal system and the development of this kind of like middle-class merchant part of society that didn't even exist before this. And then you have the kind of hierarchy or well, the hierarchy rather aristocracy, which would be the, the landed families that would be the ones that controlled cities, controlled politics. And so he was one of the children of this rising merchant class that would become a future middle class that would undo the kind of feudal system that had existed up till this time. And so he's coming up in this like new world, sort of avant-garde. His dad sells clothing. And so he's particularly enamored with just kind of appearance. It's one of the things that Francis to talk about, like he loved wearing these beautiful clothes and these different types of cloths that were coming from, especially France was one of the places they would travel to. Um, and he had this like idealistic, just like, I would say, um, almost just like this, like fiery love for life that you just wanted to like be with him and follow him. He was a king of the party, literally. They would have like these annual festivals and they would elect a king. Who's getting elected? This guy. Why? Well, for two reasons. One, he's a lot of fun, right? You want to hang out with Francis. Also, he has a lot of money. So he's paying the bill no matter what we drink, you know? So anyhow, like he just had this heart that was magnanimous and open to life and full of wonder and joy and idealism. And so what did he do? He said, I want to try and go for sort of the ideal that's before me in my time, my era, which is to become a knight and to have a princess, you know, fight a dragon, you know, the whole deal. Mm -hmm. Um, And he sets out on this quest to become a knight in order to win this honor, in order to sort of prove himself in a lot of ways, um, but also to follow this ideal and this dream that he had in his heart. And on his way, he gets sick and sort of plan starts to unravel. And while he's sick, he finds himself that night having a dream in which God appears to him. And it's not totally clear to him at this point that it's the Lord, but the Lord coming in saying, which is it better to follow, the master or or the slave? And so he he chooses in this moment, you know, to say like, whatever, obviously the master. And then, and then the Lord responds to him, then why are you following the slave? And this becomes like this, like provocation for him Mm. that, He's like, well, what do I do? I don't want to follow the slave. I want to follow the master. He says, go back to a CC and, and wait. We talked about before, like waiting, hate waiting, mm-hmm. right? Francis is sent back with this like sort of fractured ideal, an unanswered question and all of this desire. And it leads him into this, again, the silence, right? He starts seeking the silence. He starts seeking places of solitude. How is, is what's his father's name? Giovanni? Bernadoni. 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 Giovanni was his given name, correct? Yeah, Giovanni was, he was baptized Giovanni while, after St. John the Baptist. While his, his father was dad, away. Yeah, and dad comes, comes back. Comes from back, France. Says, hey, you're Frankie, the because Frenchman. France is awesome, the Frenchman. Okay, so how how did his father respond to his coming back? I mean, that's a very inglorious way to come back. Oh like, yeah. I, I mean, sick. dad was, dad at first was like, okay, you know, I want to be a little bit patient, but they began to be frustrated because Francis no longer is interested in sort of the family business as much. Mm-hmm. He's, he's sort of disconnecting from things around him and then begins to do things that his father is embarrassed and ashamed of. And you know, you can kind of get it like at a natural level. It's like your son starts acting a little bit crazy and you're trying to like discipline him and bring him back into line. And he continues to follow this path. And the path was leading him first to solitude, which led to this encounter with the Lord. There's one point where he goes into a cave in silence and solitude and comes out. And one of his companions says, and we don't even know the name of the companion that he came out of the, the cave as a man who had been transformed who had met someone and this is prior to him gathering people around him or? all this is yeah. prior to this yeah. he hasn't yet even heard the call which becomes kind of the mandate for the way of life he'll follow that led to him going selling one of his dad's horses and some of his very expensive cloth yeah. in order to have money to be able to give to this poor priest in a little simple chapel of san damiano and when he does this dad goes irate He goes and he's praying and his dad's coming to look for him. He hides. He's afraid of his father. His dad is like gathering people and saying, my son has stolen things from me. I want justice. And meanwhile, he's here praying in this chapel and he hears the Lord 
in this moment before him in the San Damiano cross, speak these words to him. He says, Francis, rebuild my church, which as you see is falling into ruins. And this becomes kind of the mandate for him. And initially he interprets it quite literally. So like the chapel he's in is a little bit fallen in, you know, kind of like run down. So he goes and he gets mortar stones and starts rebuilding, does this, does this with a few different uh, churches. And meanwhile, dad's getting more and more angry because my son's going around begging for stones. He's stolen my horse and sold it. And so what he says is he says, I'm going to dedicate my life to God. Francis does this. And his father says, I'm going to take you to the magistrate and ask you to return the things you've taken from me. And he says, you can't do that. My life has been given to God. And so this <laughs> so it's like, you, I, as a father, I fully appreciate where his oh, father yeah, is coming like, from. Absolutely pissed off. Mm. Like, you're just like, you're driving me nuts, son. And it would seem to, like, from all extents and purposes, right, the dude might be losing, like, his screws, right? I mm -hmm. mean, like, mm -hmm. what's going on to this guy? And so this leads to an encounter in front of the bishop, which is a, a kind of a famous story in the life of Francis, where his father comes asking him to return the things he's taken. And he says in front of the bishop and those that were gathered, um, before I called Francis, I called Bernardone, my, my father, P Petro Bernardone, from now on, I only have one father, our father in heaven. And he strips himself of all of his clothing. <laughs> Pause there. Strips himself. Yeah, we're talking of all. Just imagine me doing that. No, don't don't, don't do me that. Doing that. <laughs> yeah, but imagine skinny a dipping with Francis <laughs> actually doing that. Yeah, everyone looking on me like. I mean, it's funny here at Franciscan. We get a lot of enthusiastic Christians. You know. Oh yeah. They show up with like wool that what looks to be wool crucifixes around their neck. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. the fervor. Yeah, it's come a, on. But it's a bit. But I love this because it kind of uh, it shows us that 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 heart, that wild heart, mm -hmm. is. He's like all in. Yeah. I mean, in in the most radical way, and the thing that happens at that point, right, is like he's naked, and the bishop comes and takes his cloak and puts it over him. Everybody's like, "Thank you, Jesus." You know, he's not naked anymore. Appreciate you that. Know, more striptease and, and the Francis, like, you know, and you, like, and you can keep that. Yeah. <laughs> But then he takes a simple cloak and a belt that he puts around him, which is the sign of basically like a kind of a pilgrim mendicant. Yeah. Um, and he takes off. Yeah. And he's got no plan. And he is filled with his joy. Now, he's a romantic idealist. And so what does he do? He starts traipsing through these woods and he's singing French love songs. What a guy. And he's just filled with this tremendous joy. Then he's attacked by these robbers. And these robbers like are like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm the hero of the great king. And they're like, you're nuts, you know? And like they beat him up and throw him in the snow. And then he gets up, jumps out of the snow drift, and starts singing again. And this like song that's in him, in some senses, is reflective of what his life becomes which is this like praise of the Lord in my beautiful gift of being poor and having nothing but the father to provide for me and knowing that that is like not just more than enough, but it's over abundant. And so this love of the father and this relationship with Jesus becomes his way of life. And what he does is he sets out on a path of renewal for his own heart. And he, he didn't do this thinking that anybody was going to follow him, by the way. It wasn't like Francis is like, let me start a new community. Francis said, let me start following in the footsteps of Jesus. And that phrase is really like a, a linchpin keystone for him. Following in the footsteps of Jesus. So in his sort of like vision of the spiritual life, and Francis gives us no major treaties on the spiritual life. And part of that is caught up with, he has this preoccupation with what? I don't want to just say something. I want to do something, which I like about him. He's not a man of words as much as he is a man of action. If you want to know what it means to live a Franciscan spirituality, it's his life that is going to teach. There's other spiritual writers that give us like full on treaties, like St. John of the Cross, right? You know, it's like the ascent of Mount Carmel. Mm -hmm. um, so in his case, he's not doing that. He's looking at the gospel, looking at Jesus, following in his footsteps and seeking 
to do what he sees Christ doing and seeking to discern what it means to live the gospel in the context well, that he was in. He's doing what Christ did. I mean, this is one of the questions Aquinas answers in the Summa, like, why didn't Christ write anything? And, mm. he, and, and Thomas says, well, it's because he's like Socrates who didn't write anything because it's, mm. it's better to teach through action. Mm. That's actually the, the preferred method. Mm. So it sounds like Francis's. Yeah. So yeah. he's doing it. And, and with that, all of a sudden around him, there are others that see his way of life. Mm. And there's some and, of- and just just to pause here too for those who aren't aware. I mean, the mendicant orders, the Dominicans, mendicare meaning to beg, mm-hmm. right? The Franciscans, the Dominicans. Yeah. These were new movements that were unlike the established orders of priests oh, yeah. or the Cistercian, the Benedictines at the time. Yeah. This would have been. This would have been. This, would have been, this is why it was so embarrassing. <laughs> Part of why it was so embarrassing for Aquinas's uh, mother. To, mm-hmm. to see him go off with this weird begging order. Oh, yeah. So Which it's not like a mark of joy. She, no. They wanted him to be a Benedictine. They're ashamed. Yeah. I mean, many families were ashamed. And in fact, like, that's why I write both Augustine and Bonaventure write this defense of the mendicants yes. because there's this attack coming. What is this? Oh, yeah. And And this is something that I find interesting, not to get too off track, but like with Francis, why... I think he is a tremendous witness for the world that we're in right now in the life of the church in this point in history is because Francis lived just on the heels of a a council, Lateran IV. Mm -hmm. He lived in a state of social epical transition that Mm -hmm. was completely unstable. Life, world, politics were getting turned upside down. And there were scandal in the church. There was difficulties. There was questions about the use and abuse of authority. And all of this was his context. And at that moment, around his group of penitentes of Assisi, which is what they're originally called, Mm. are all these other groups that are growing up, which actually Dominic is going to be responding to at the Dominican order, Mm. um, the Waldensians, Mm. the Albigensians, who are looking at this um, confusion and scandal and become these frontline critics of the church, of the pope, of bishops, of clergy, and claiming sort of like what authentic faith looks like is our way. Right. And And, and that's important to realize, right? The Waldensians and these others were were living poverty greater than the clerics. They were emphasizing scripture greater than the Catholics of the day. Exactly. So what Francis and Dominic did said was, you're you're right here. You're right. You're wrong here. Exactly. So we'll be the... And that's where, like, for him, the obedience. So in the rule of St. Francis, it says at the very beginning, first chapter, this is the rule in life of the friars minor, namely to observe the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, living in obedience, in poverty, and in chastity. And then he goes on to say, and I, Francis, promise obedience to our Lord Pope Honorius and his lawful successors. From the beginning, this is kind of like the 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 point where it's so difficult, and this is church history is full of this. We see problems in the church. We want to seek a pathway of renewal and authenticity, a return to living the gospel in its fullness, the full proclamation of the faith. And the tension arises, which is, I want to do this, but then how can I do this and remain in obedience to the legitimate authority Mm -hmm. of Mother Church? Mm -hmm. And the Waldensians and Albigensians said, no, I am the one who possesses the authentic faith, and I stand in judgment on the church, her clerics, and her leadership. And follow us, because this is what traditional, authentic Mm -hmm. Catholicism is. And Francis says, no, like, I'm going to live poverty radically, and I'm going to root my life in the word of God. In fact, the origin of the rule of Francis is scripture. <laughs> I mean, they, as they were trying to figure out how to live their life at the beginning, what does he do? He says to the guys who come to him, who are like, hey, we don't know exactly what you're doing, but we want to do that. And he says, I'm not really sure we're supposed to be doing either. So why don't we go ask the Lord? And they go. And this is a beautiful thing. The place that Francis heard scripture and the place in which he encountered God through the word was liturgy. So the word of God that was proclaimed in the liturgy was the place where Francis had his greatest access. Later, when he became a cleric, he was ordained a deacon, but not a priest. He would be praying the breviary and obviously would be encountering the word of God there. But he goes to the priest, ask him, please, can you bring us the gospels? And he does basically the old like Bible roulette and opens up three different times to find what what is our way of life supposed to look like? And this is where he flips to where he 
tells the rich young man, if you would be perfect, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. He also finds the point where he sends out his 72 and says, don't take a walking staff or sandals Mm. or a money bag or a belt. Um, This radical dependence on providence. And then he finds where Jesus says in Matthew, if you be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Mm -hmm. And the scripture, the word of God becomes the basis of their way of life. But because of his recognition of this authority of the church, what does he do from the outset? He goes to Rome to the Holy Father and says, this is the way of life that the Lord's calling us to. Will you approve this? And the first response is, no way. (laughs) But then tradition, of course, you know, there's some of this, it's like historical evidence or facts around it as far as paper trails go, get a little bit dicey when you go back far in history. But the tradition is that the Holy Father went, had a dream that night after he had told Francis no. Mm -hmm. And in that dream, he sees actually Lateran Basilica, which is falling over in this poor man dressed in a robe, holding it up with his shoulder. Mm. And this is the response of the Lord to um, Pope Honoris at this time, or Pope Innocent the third, that, uh, that then gives him the, the confirmation that I'm supposed to say yes to this way of life. And so he approves it. And Francis goes out and this is, so he's got 12 guys in 1209. He dies, right? Roughly 26 years later or okay. 25 years later. Um, after this point, when he dies, <laughs> yeah. there are somewhere between five to 6,000 Franciscans. That is unbelievable. That is so hard And to changes fathom. the whole face of the church. It's so hard to fathom, eh? This that one guy. thousand people. Imagine if one uh, vocations director found 5,000 right? people <laughs> in his term. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh my hey, goodness. Please write books. Yes. Tell us how to do this. Yes. Like, this is a movement of the spirit. And, and, it, and it, it was. Like from the beginning, like Francis was a man who was moved by the spirit of the Lord, was aware mm. that the incarnation was not merely an event of the past, but was the ongoing reality of God's presence in our midst. And also one of the aspects of his life from the beginning that was essential to his encounter with the living God, there were two of them, I would say. One was the discovery of the presence of the truth where Jesus says in Matthew 25, what you do to the least of my brethren that you did to me. And there's this beautiful story of his life as he's coming out of kind of the party boy, Mm -hmm. I'm concerned with the clothes I'm wearing and the people I'm hanging out with type of life. In beginning this new way of life, he makes a promise to God. If anyone ask me for alms for the love of God, I will not refuse him. And as he makes this promise, he sometime later finds himself on a, on a horse riding through the countryside. And all of a sudden, who shows up out of the middle of nowhere? A leper. And Francis, and talk about this, like he had a disdain. Dude was just like, Ugh, you know, like the, mm-hmm, you know, like somebody mm-hmm. sees a cockroach and like, ah, you know, like this is Francis with lepers, like could not stand them. Yeah. Not even the sight and certainly not the smell because Holy rotting flesh. Understanding. Definitely, Understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Like rotting flesh doesn't smell great. Right. So he's got this disposition towards lepers and one shows up and says, for the love of God, alms. And his first response is he like kicks his horse and starts trucking it, but then remembers what he told the Lord Mm. and stops and turns around and comes back, dismounts, goes to that leper, takes coins out of his money bag, gives it to him, and then does something that he never would have imagined doing. After he's put these coins in the hands of the leper, he takes the leper's hand, raises it up and kisses like this rotten flesh of the hand of a leper and then gets back on his horse and begins to ride away. And as he turns back to see the leper, there's no one to be seen. Mm. And so this moment, and at the end of his life, interestingly, at the end of his life, he writes about it in his Testament. He says, the Lord led me amongst the lepers and what before was bitter, he made Mm. sweet. And at the beginning of his life, this was part of his experience of God was serving the poor and being with the lepers. He literally moved into a leprosarium and was serving them at the beginning as part of this conversion as he's starting this new way of life. Um, and, And the other piece of him that I think is also 
so essential that sometimes, I don't know, I think sometimes it get missed because like people are like the birdbath Francis, right? You're like, like he had this profound appreciation and love for the mystery of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, which manifested itself in a devotion to the Mm -hmm. incarnation and the mystery of the birth of Jesus and the poverty of Bethlehem. Anybody who's ever been to any church and had a mm-hmm. crush there can say, thank you, St. Francis, because my man was the first one that did that mm-hmm. <laughs> way back when, right? In Greccio. Um, and then also a love for Jesus Christ crucified, the humility of a God who allow himself to share in our suffering, not just yeah. our humanity, but our suffering. And then finally, this tremendous love for Jesus in the Eucharist in which he recognized that this humility of God who comes down to this earth and is born as one of us, the humility and love of God who gives himself to us on the cross is the same humility and love of God that comes to us hidden under the appearance of bread and wine. And so his life became centered around these things, these Mm -hmm. mysteries, this presence of God, this tangible nature. And when that happened, when he realized that like Jesus, right, like came into this world, then his experience of the world radically transformed. And guess what happens? This is where the birdbath piece comes from. Because he knew that the word became flesh, everything in material reality for him then transformed into a moment and a point and a place of encounter with God. And so when he looked out at creation, he didn't just see sort of like random atoms that are like bouncing together. He didn't just see sort of like this mindless evolution following some kind of principle, you know, of like survival of the fittest. He saw the fruit of a creator who had created the beauty Mm -hmm. of everything that exists, which is where at the end of his life, right? He writes that beautiful hymn that many people know, the Canticle of Creatures, where he sees the truth of this relationship mm-hmm. that exists between ourselves and all of creation, because the same source and origin is all of our source and origin, which is God, the Trinity. Um, and so Francis begins this way of life and these men draw near to him and he shows a path. And, and the reason that I think it's very apt for this moment is that when I think about his life, I think about our own moment in the history of the church, right? Yep social upheaval, a change of epoch, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's just true, right? Like we are in these moments of like massive shifts yeah. societally. Tectonic plates. Amazing. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just absolutely mind boggling to think about yeah. all the things that have happened in the last, even yeah. last few decades. Yeah. Um, we're talking also about a moment in a life in the church and you don't have to even look to the present, but even the past of like the, all the scandals that have rocked the face of the church and the confusion that abounds in the life of the church right now at this moment as well. Mm -hmm. And so Francis in his time in a similar situation, right? How did he respond? And that's where I'm looking for myself just personally. I mean, even beyond whatever it might say to others, like what does it mean for myself to work for authentic renewal in the life of the church now? And, and I look to him and I find these examples like this Eucharistic centered life, this humility that is absolutely like radically committed to the conversion of what my own heart mm-hmm. and also a humble obedience and reverence for the church and her leadership, even when I don't get it. I don't understand, and I might even disagree. Yeah, or even when the leadership are sinful and and wrong. Yeah, well, yeah. there's a story of this moment. Like for him, this is what happens. He's coming into a town where he's being asked to come and preach, and That's as he right. comes near, they say, "Hey, guess what? You need to come and meet with the priest who is the 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 pastor of this parish here in town because he's living with a concubine. Like he's got a woman living with him. Like uh-huh. everybody knows it." Yeah. open, grave, moral, evil, scandalous behavior. And here's Francis and he comes into town and his response is he goes, he walks up to this cleric. Everybody's like, oh man, now it's coming. Francis is here. The saint's going to give him the one, two. And he drops to his knees in front of the priest, takes his hands, grabs them and kisses both of them 
He says, I kiss the hands that bring me Jesus in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And he stands up and he keeps walking. Mm -hmm. And in his writings, he speaks of this like reverence, not for the man, (laughs) but for the one who this man has been ordained in conformity to Jesus Christ. That's expressed in his reverence for the, the uh, legitimate authority in the life of the church. And it's, and it is a tension. And I think this is the thing. Francis like said yes to not moving out of the tension. And this is so tough. And I struggle with this personally. Like just, just, just me. Like I struggle with like this tension of like, God, like how can I really be faithful to you and really trust when I feel like sometimes the people around me or those who might be in leadership aren't following you and aren't actually working for the true good of the gospel and, the, like, and who you are. Like, what does it look like to stay in this place like where I am humbly trusting mm-hmm. that you're working through the mess, but also faithfully pressing into this deeper conformity to your heart, Jesus. And in the history of the church, we've always found that like the response to choose sides is exactly what the word in Greek comes from that's heresis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Choosing. Yeah, interesting. It's choosing a side and saying it's either this Mm -hmm. or it's this. And where does Jesus remain? Always in this place of tension, which is the cross, which is where Francis found his refuge and what he's ultimately conformed to in the stigmata is, is it like, even in this tension where it's like, I don't even know what to do, but I'm not going to abandon you, Jesus. I'm not going to choose a side that you haven't chosen. I'm not going to follow a path that you haven't walked. And I'm gonna stay here where I'm stretched out in seemingly paradoxical opposite Mm. directions and just like, Lord, to whom else will we go? Mm. You alone have the words of eternal life. And and like the heresies and the things that have happened in the life of the church are are the fruit of us being in that tension. It's like, I can't handle this. I gotta get out of it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there's a lot of questions and issues in the life of the church in our moment right now that we're seeing that tension and there's this temptation to move out of the tension. Mm -hmm. And it can seem like it's even good or true or right, but it's like, what did Francis do? His whole life he says, what is it that Jesus did? How is it that Jesus lived? What is it that he spoke? And that's what I want to do because he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And there's none other. And that type of the, this like radical surrender to Christ is what bore fruit when he said yes to I will die. Then all of a sudden the truth of Jesus' words were seen in his life, right? Uh, yeah, amen. Well said. What happened to Francis towards the end of his life? My understanding, I don't have a great deal of understanding mm-hmm. about Francis, was that maybe the some of the order turned on him and he may have been kicked out of his head position. And he, well, he resigned. So this is yeah. what happens. It's a little bit crazy. You know, you talk about like, here's a, a saint, right? You know, like everybody looks back. He's so awesome. It was so easy. You know, you love Jesus and you're like traipsing through like, you know, prairies and, you know, meadows and just kind of like in this bliss. It was like, no, he goes on this mission over to the Middle East mm-hmm. in order to evangelize the Muslims. What a guy. And he's like, I'm going to go preach the gospel to these folks. You're coming with arms. I'm coming with the cross. Mm -hmm. And that's when he meets the Sultan and proclaims to him the good news of the gospel and tells him, Hey, you know what? If you don't believe me, why don't you bring all of your best sort of like, you know, imams and let's make a really big fire. And you guys and me will get in the fire. You pick your top dudes and me and we'll get in the fire. And whoever is not burned alive, that's the real God. Like, talk about radical. He was ready to literally, like, step into a fire because he knew and believed in who Jesus Christ is. And he says, you know what? Because I want you to know that truth, too. The imams, I don't know why, but they denied the uh, invitation (laughs) to the party. Um, and, uh, And so he ends up nonetheless being given permission to visit all the holy sites which were at that Mm. point because of the crusades and the wars going on inaccessible to christians that were from the west so he does this but then word comes to him you've got to return things are just falling into chaos 
And so part of the chaos was as people were trying to sort of like change the rule as he had established it. We're trying to add things or take things away. You're a bit too radical, Francis. I mean, we can't really live the poverty you're talking about. Okay, because earlier you said his rule was the Gospels. But so it sounds like over time it became more concrete and specific. It was. And it, it, it the rule that we have, there's there's... There's three different rules that we know of. Okay. One was a rule that he was approved verbally in 1209. And then there is another rule that is never approved called the Regula Nambulata that's in 1221. And then the rule that we have, the rule of St. Francis, which is approved in 1223. And the in between 1209 and 1221, people were like trying to change things remove radical pro the, uh, poverty. Mm. One of the things is like, well, we surely should be able to own some property. Cause what can we do if we don't have a place to live? Can we have some books? Yeah, yeah. books. It was all these, there was questions that were yeah. arising and also had to do with um, receiving letters from the Holy Father because they were going out <coughs> and evangelizing and people didn't know who they were. Some of them literally got like their butts whooped, like, you know, like beaten, put in prison. And he was like, rejoice that you're able to suffer for the sake of Christ. <laughs> He's like, don't look for like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. I get a However, letter? I'd like a letter that says like, you know, like letter of good standing, please. And he's like, no, he's like, the disciples had no letters of good standing. He was like, we're going to go out and preach the gospel. And so people, there's tension, you know, and then to be honest, they're like, I'm sitting here, like, I kind of get some of that tension, you know, but he comes back into this just real disorder that's happening. And the one that he had put in charge has <sighs> caused the order to move in a direction that he doesn't approve. But he steps down voluntarily from the role of leadership as being the superior in the community and just pulls back. And this is where there's a couple of years mm. where it talks about, and you find this in some of the writings that come later from people who are close to him, where he's depressed, mm. he's downcast, he's kind of morose, he's, he's pulled back, he's, mm. he's sort of introverted, he's kind of inside of himself and people can't get him to kind of be the Francis that you used to be. And in I mean, that, talk about, you know, you talked about not trying to resolve the tension. And that mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense when it's something we don't even have authority over. You know what I mean? So it's like, even yeah. if I wanted to resolve it for the yeah. church, I'm not in a place to do that. Yep. Francis presumably is in a place to resolve tension within his order that oh, he yeah. founded. And yet he willingly, he willingly leaves it. And we know that one of the reasons that he does that, at least in the writings that he has to his brothers, because he writes to them in those admonitions that I've been kind of referring yeah. to. He talks about, he says, um, blessed is that brother who receives accusation unjustly and accepts it in order to continue to live in communion with his brothers. Mm. I'm like, yo, I'm not there. <laughs> Definitely not there. <laughs> but Francis like cherished and reverenced the communion of the brothers in such a way that he pulls back from leadership because there's tension and fighting and he knows that he's a part of it and he says i would rather that the brethren be united and this I reminds me of what pope benedict may have done right yeah Can you imagine resigning oh pulling back no like people don't understand why even yeah. now i kind of am a little upset yeah. right yeah uh, and yet he goes into silence mm -hmm. the faith it would take i mean how many friars would have been on francis's side oh yeah they're seeing the changes take place and they're like you've you've abandoned your responsibility oh, Francis. Yeah. i mean he was that was exactly what he's experiencing and and so he's in this tension and frustration and struggle he finds himself finally at this place where he's kind of at wits end and he's like i just i just have to go into solitude and so he goes to fast and pray before the feast of saint michael so there was different times of year where francis fasted one was from the feast of the assumption until the feast of the holy archangels of saint michael at the end of september 29th so he goes up to this hermitage mount laverna and he just seeks solitude and he tells his brothers if you see you know when you come in the morning if you see this you know cup out here then you can approach. But if you don't see it, don't come near. Mm. And he just goes into the solitude. I say that to my kids and they still come. <laughs> it's, it's very annoying. I know. It's like, I put the cup there. You know what it means? Don't disturb daddy. Yeah. Unfortunately, four-year-olds are not quite yeah. the same as all the friars sometimes even still. <laughs> I mean, all right. So I didn't mean to cut you off. No, so no, they, no. They, uh... So they're there. And on that, and on that mountain in that time of solitude is when Francis has this 
a mystical experience that is beyond explanation <clears throat> in which he has before him this vision of a seraph angel on a cross crucified who is suspended in the air and he beholds him and he speaks about this experience. So kind of the cross, Jesus Christ crucified meets him on Mount Laverna and he speaks about this love so sweet that is beyond explanation and this pain so deep that he wanted to die. Talk about tension. Yeah. Talk about paradox. <laughs> talk about a place where you're just sort of, and so wow. Francis in that place, right, of encounter with the Lord has this experience, which never in the history of the church before this moment, as far as I know, here we go. Here it is. Of course, no one will see that and we don't need to show it to That's them. That's right. But it's Not a gonna, card of can't see Francis it. receiving this. Yeah. Right in French, I think it in is. In French. Yeah. Beautiful. Don't do French. If it was Spanish, I could help you. But yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So Francis receives this grace of being conformed to Jesus Christ crucified. And you can kind of think about this, right? Like Jesus himself, like the cross is his ultimate moment of surrender and obedience to the paradox of the way that the father chooses to redeem humanity. And this choice in the face of all of these voices that are saying to him, whether it's Peter in the garden with the sword, defend yourself, whether it's Pilate who's saying, say something and I'll get you out of here. I'm just looking for an excuse not to condemn you mm -hmm. and his silence. And then on the cross, come down from there, come down from there and we'll believe in you. All these voices that want to call you out of that tension. And he says, nope, like I'm going to stay here because this is where the mystery of redemption is going to unfold. This is where I make all things new. This is where I teach you mm. who the Father is. One whom you can trust and entrust yourself to even in the face of the mystery of suffering and death. And the love that sustains even through that darkness. And so Francis meets him in that place of his own darkness in his life. And this mystery of a love that is beyond explanation and a pain that makes him want to die and all of a sudden finds himself bearing in his body, it says in his hands and his feet and his side, these wounds of, of Jesus. Just like love lets itself be wounded for the beloved. You know, I, I know that some people speculate about St. Paul and whether he bore in his mm -hmm. body the, oh, yeah. the wounds of Christ, but is Francis the first kind of credible documented evidence we as have of the far stigmata? as i know but you can fact check me on that because no, no. i'm not sure like but so far as i know he's the first stigmata that's recorded which is also why it became such a a point of contention and also a mystery and he he safeguarded and hid them similar to like padre pio it sort of didn't want anybody to see them and it was in the last two years of his life that he bore those and it's at the end of his life that we, we read about Bonaventure talking about them, that there were those who were there when he died who finally were able to witness the wounds on his body um, of, what, of the stigmata mm -hmm. there at his death. And I, again, this might be sort of um, hagiographical legend, but it's said that Claire comes and reverences his body and when she kisses the wounds, tries to pull out what would appear to be nails. Hmm. Cause it talked about he had these wounds in his flesh and then formed these black sort of nodule things that appeared to be nails on the surface. Hmm. So the rest of his life, he's burying these wounds in his body. And at the same time, he's suffering physically, right? He goes blind at the end of his life. And here's the thing that I think people don't realize, like when they're like bird bathing St. Francis, um, <laughs> bird bathing. is that that beautiful canticle of creatures is written when Francis at the end of his life is blind and is in this cell where mice are coming and tormenting him at night and he's suffering tremendously and has a stigmata and is physically experiencing the pain of that and also simultaneously feels the weight of his order moving in a direction hmm. which he thinks is a departure from the original ideal and inspiration he received. And in that place, he writes the canticle of creatures, mm. which is this 
tremendous proclamation, right? I mean, it's a call of all creation to praise God, mm -hmm. but it's a proclamation of his faith. Um, and it's, to me, sort of a sign that he discovered something in that darkness, discovered something in that mystery of the cross, which broke out in the same way that the light of the resurrection broke out three days after Calvary. And it breaks out in song for him. He starts his life of this penitente of Assisi singing and he ends his life singing. He's singing French love songs at the beginning and now he's singing the Canticle of Creatures, which he set to a tune and his brothers would sing mm. in praise of God. Um, and this is Francis, the real Francis, right? <laughs> Not the caricature, not the sort of like singing, dancing through the meadows, certainly not a birdbath, um, but a man who knew Jesus Christ yeah. and gave his life. What's funny though is like, I think sometimes we can also kind of react to abuses and mm -hmm. then, and then lose sight of what actually was there, you know, like mm. what I mean by that is, I mean, you, you could imagine someone saying, uh, well, he wasn't just this fella. And I know you're not saying this. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that, but he wasn't just this fellow who was skipping through meadows and hanging out with birds. And then you forget mm -hmm. that, well, he also maybe did do that. And we should also yeah. talk about that. How yeah. beautiful is that? That he, yeah. Tell, tell us about the uh, Francis the and the wolf. Oh yeah. <laughs> Gubbio. I mean, the thing about Francis is, is that he was a man who was reconciled to the Lord and sought to become this kind of instrument of reconciliation with others. And for him, reconciliation is about stepping into and living this truth of relationship with the Father as our creator. And that happens only through Jesus. And once this happened for him and he began to recognize who God was and who he was, mm -hmm. he then began to realize, wow, if this is true, if like, Lord, you are real and you are the source of all that is, and I'm made in your image and likeness and called into relationship with you, it's also true that everything that exists is the fruit of your love. And so now the trees, mm. the birds, the sun, the moon, the wolf are no longer sort of things out there, yeah. but our brother and sister in the true sense of having this common shared father as creator, mm -hmm. who's the source of all. Could I read the canticle? Yes. And if you know it, say it along with me. I don't know. But most mm -hmm. high or powerful or good Lord or praise is yours or glory or honor and all blessing. Mm -hmm. To you alone, mm -hmm. most high, do they belong. And no mortal lips are worthy to pronounce your name. Mm -hmm. Praise be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother praise Son, mm -hmm. who is the day through whom you give us light. And mm -hmm. he is beautiful and radiant and great with great splendor of you, most high. He bears the mm -hmm. likeness. Praise be you, my Lord, through sister moon and the stars and the heavens. You have made them bright, precious, and fair. Praise be you, my Lord, through brother's wind and air and fair and stormy all weather's moods by which you cherish all that you have made. Praise be you, my Lord, through sister water, so useful, humble, whew, precious, and pure. Praise be you, my Lord, through brother fire, through whom you light the night, and he is beautiful and playful and robust mm. and strong. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister mother earth. See, she's mm. still sister, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the pagan idea of mother mm -hmm. earth, sister mother earth, mm -hmm. who sustains and governs us, producing varied fruits with colored flowers and herbs. Mm. Praise be you, my Lord, through those who grant pardon for love of you and bear sickness and trial. Mm. Blessed are those who endure in endure. There's that tension line, right? Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who endure in peace. By you, most high, they will be crowned. Praise be you, my Lord, through sister death. Mm. <laughs> Oof. From whom no one living can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are they, she finds doing your will. No second death can do harm to them. Praise and bless my Lord right. uh, and, and give, give him, him thanks, thanks and serve him with great humility. I won't look it up and, and go through them, but what are these things you're telling us to read? These uh, Exhortations, the admonitions or, of Saint Francis. Because I mean, if you put all of his writings into a book, is it a mm -hmm. small book? Yep. Yeah, it's approximately that thing. <laughs> so he has, um, 
a number of so first off you have prayers wow, from him i see so there's there's 28 right 28 yes. yeah and in our life as uh franciscans of the renewal each day we read one of them mm-hmm. as part of our examination of conscience together in the context of night that. prayer. So the words of Francis continue to... It fits within a month, right? So you just cycle through yeah, them. Yeah, and so you're hearing those and being called to this higher way of life. That, And interestingly, those admonitions actually are believed to be a collection of exhortations which he gave to all the friars at their general chapters over mm-hmm. the course of a number of years. So when they would come together, it speaks about him exhorting the brothers to this life that they've been called to live. And the collection of those exhortations is what the admonitions is believed to be. Wow. And Which, the, what's your favorite one? Mm, my favorite admonition. I think that one that I was referencing before about the Eucharist because it's just been such a powerful insight to me of how to actively do something mm-hmm. to deepen my faith and my capacity to encounter Jesus, both in the Eucharist, but in, in daily life, which is through a greater devotion to the Holy Spirit and asking for that Holy Spirit to reveal his presence to me where I can't yet perceive him. Well, I want to read just one. Mm-hmm. It's number two, the evil of self-will. Oh, yeah. Because this is one <laughs> that get, either gets beaten out of you in community or you become bitter yeah. or you leave. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you don't right. see The Lord God said to Adam, of every tree of paradise thou shalt eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. Mm. Adam, therefore, might eat of every tree of paradise, and so mm-hmm. long as he did not offend against obedience, he did not sin. For one eats of the tree of knowledge of good who appropriates to himself his own will mm. and prides himself upon the goods which the Lord publishes and works in him, and thus, through the suggestion of the devil and transgression of the commandment, he finds the apple of the knowledge of evil, wherefore it behooves that he suffer punishment." All right, explain what that means to me. It means that, um, so appropriation, disappropriation. Okay. So to appropriate is yeah. to claim something for my own. Yeah. To disappropriate is to relinquish my right over this. Mm. And for Francis, actually, the words that he uses in Latin and the rule that are what would be referred to as poverty is not poverty, but sine proprio. Okay. Without anything of my own. Okay. For him, the kind of fundamental paradigm and prism for poverty is is disappropriation. Mm-hmm. And the reason that he sees that is, is what you'll find in a later um, admonition, the only thing I can claim for my own are my sins and my weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Anything else I try to appropriate <laughs> is actually wild? a lie. <laughs> There's something disingenuous about yeah. this appropriation. Yeah. And he also does it because what does he see in in Jesus? He sees Philippians 2. He did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but rather he emptied himself. He disappropriated himself of his divinity, humbly accepting the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men, being obedient even unto death, death on a cross. So he he sees Jesus like showing the way Mm. through the incarnation and then he recognizes in the truth of who I am as a human being and a creature is actually none of this is mine. And so what he recognizes is the last bastion of, of, um, of this fight against poverty is not something, but it's my will. And so the greatest sort of relinquishing through poverty, or the greatest disappropriation is the surrendering oh, of my will. Yeah. Because I, you know, that is the hardest thing. Oh man! I mean, that's what we're talking you, about. You the community, you, yeah. like that's where you just like, oh boy, like I, I want to hold on to, like, and it can what be the, I want. I do I, I what I do want. What I want to do. I want to, and I do want to do it the way I want to do it. Yeah, because and it's the best way. Obviously, <laughs> at least, right, man. And this is true in family life. I mean, you come home mm. from a full day of work, and there's mess, and there's loud yeah. children. Yeah. And and sometimes when I get grumpy, <laughs> it's because I'm not submitting myself to the will of God. Yeah. To the permissive will of God that should have beautiful children be loud and crazy. That's right. <laughs> I, and, you know, I mean, obviously there's totally. something to be said of having order in the home and disciplining children, of course. Yeah. But but, but submitting to the, the wildness of family mm-hmm. life and, you know, maybe I, what I wanted to do is sit out in the front stoop and have a pipe and chat with my bride. But uh, yeah. my children have wants and to submit yourself to that. That is the hardest thing to do, to yeah. kill your will. Yeah. 
You can give everything away, but if I don't have love. It is interesting. They say that for there's kind of differences with um, religious. I don't know how true this is. It's just sort of a a maxim that was said to me, whether or not it applies to women, I don't know, but men I can certainly attest to. Um, But it said that as you enter religious life, for women, the most challenging sort of vow of the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Yep. Often obedience is the most difficult at the beginning. For, for the sisters. For okay. the sisters. And for men, oh. often at the beginning, the most difficult is chastity. chastity. Whereas yeah. in the fullness of religious life, the vow that ends up costing the most for women and being the most challenging is chastity. And motherhood. Mother, I yeah. mean, I think that's what I think it yeah. is. It's the, the relationship to motherhood. Yeah, yeah. And for men... Oh, B B N S. Totally. Yes. I mean, you know, it's like the because at some point you want to be the king of my my little kingdom. I mean, like as a father and family, you know, he's sort of like I, I want to sort of have a place where I'm so sitting right. in a posture of authority and yes. you know, and 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 sort of guiding things and making decisions and you know, and it's like obedience. Are you serious? I'm a grown man. Like, stop, mm. stop treat, treat me like a boy. You know, and it's like. And that's what Francis is getting after with that, is it that the evil of self-will is the same evil that entered into the heart of Adam and Eve when they grasped with this apple and said, non servit, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's my way. Yeah. I frequently drive through red lights in this town on purpose. (laughs) Because they are not. As a protest of the fact that yes, somebody did not nonsense, coordinate them appropriately. And I will not have electric things telling me what to do. <laughs> but, In Minecraft. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I should, or at least, I think one of the reasons it's difficult to, to, to die to our will is it, it's like the individual death isn't worth writing home about, as they say. And it's mm. not, and it, nothing seems to be affected after I do that. So if I drive home today and choose to stop at the red light and go, thank you, Lord, for this red light, I don't feel like an explosion of piety yeah. within me. <laughs> You're right. I just, whatever. It's nothing. Yeah. Um, so I imagine it has to be like the accumulated effect of like well, death by pinpricks kind of thing. Is that? Well, I think because, okay, like obedience, right? Listening, obedere has to do with listening, hearkening. Yeah, yeah. Um, and hearkening and trust to the voice that's speaking to me. <laughs> I'm just thinking now I can see the red lights as a symbol of blood and dying to myself. <laughs> You're like, <"Kata!" laughs> got me again. Yeah. Little deaths, little yeah. deaths. But like the undoing, I was just this morning, I was just praying the rosary and I don't know why I was just struck again with the, like the drama of the first mystery of the rosary of this agony in the garden. Mm. Where like Jesus goes back to the garden, right? where the original sin occurred of disobedience and he Mm. wrestles with the tension, which is, I don't understand this. I don't want this. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Not my will, but yours be done. And that obedience is what Francis sees and says, this is the way. You know, not mm-hmm. because it's like Mandalorian or something, but mm-hmm. this is the way because Jesus Christ is the way. Mm-hmm. And this is the way to authentic freedom because the truth is what sets me free. And the truth is who, what the Father asks of me. The truth is what the Father says to me. It's his will that is the truth of what is actually good for me. And that's, you know, in some sense, it's kind of the antithesis to the postmodern experience and the postmodern man who says, no, like freedom is, is this, mm-hmm unshackling my entire existence from any reference to anything outside of myself and a radical mm-hmm. quote unquote freedom to just do whatever I want, be whatever I want. This, this, and, and at the end, right. It's like, it's a total like false illusion. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you only exist because your mom and dad, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. You, know, you not, have a belly button you to remind be, uh, you. You yeah. have two names that weren't, you didn't sorry. choose probably. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But but for Francis, it's like obedience is the pathway to freedom. Yeah. And that is radical. And it's something that's, I'm, you know, it's like when I choose it, oof, it costs something. Why? Because guess what? Like, I'm just still full of myself. I know it. I'd like to not be, but I'm just so full of myself. Mm. And obedience is the way in which the Lord empties us of ourselves. 
it's it's easy to confess general sins, isn't it? Like mm-hmm. I'm lustful or I'm full of myself. It's really hard to then name that particular thing. Mm-hmm. Well, he said this specifically and I didn't like that. Like we don't like that. Oh yeah. It's like what I said earlier. Like I'm a sinner. We say that. Oh yeah. But we don't say, well, I'm I, I was rude to this man because he smelt bad or something. Yeah. No, Probably. for me, one of the places where I just frequently sin is like driving in New York. Yeah. And I'm just like from time to time, I wish it was more often, the Lord will just remind me, like, what would this person think if they saw who you were and the way that you just acted? I'm just like, I don't like that question, I don't Jesus. like that. Come on, stop that. It's like you just, like, cut them off, honk the horn. I'm like, get out. You're not going to let you in. You're trying to merge. <laughs> exactly. You're like, oh, you know, what's wrong with these people? You know, I'm like, uh, look in the mirror, dude. Um, I mean, I see that, you know, it's like one of these places where I'm like, oh, man, yeah. I'm totally convinced that what I'm doing, where I'm going in my time is the most important thing that exists. Mm -hmm. And anything that gets in the way of that is an obstacle that ought to be removed or destroyed. Yes. If I had an RPG in this vehicle with me. (laughs) It would be bad. (laughs) It would be bad. Um, Some fella is watching right now and he's thinking, I'd like to consider joining the Friars of the Renewal or I'd Mm. like to apply or I'd like to learn more. Yeah. I mean, so two questions. One is a practical question. Mm-hmm. How do they, in fact, learn more? Okay. But also maybe a discernment question. How, yeah. how, what advice would you give to a young man or a young woman discerning mm-hmm. your uh, sisters? What should they start doing? Um, I mean, I think the first thing, it's the simplest, is, is pray. Because if a vocation oh. is a calling and prayer is my heart communicating with the heart of Christ and through him the heart of the Father and the Spirit, then... Prayer is where I'm going to hear that call. Now, I'm certainly attentive to my life, but because sometimes I'm like asking, what do you want, God? But like, am I giving him that time? Spoke before about silence, like make room in your life for some silence to listen and ask the Lord, what is it that you desire of my life? And to just wait and fight to be present and just in a posture of receptivity. Um, Second thing is, is if you're thinking about being a Franciscan, like, what do you know about St. Francis? So there's amongst many different biographies out there. One that we recommend often is by a guy named Engelbert. So it's just called St. Francis of Assisi. I think it's a good thing just to read his life. If I read his life and I'm like, oh, he's cool. And then like I can put it down. Go check out, you know, the Dominicans. Go check out the Jesuits. Go check, you know. But if you read that and I'm like, man, like I want this. You know, well then give us a call. So there's, you know, we have um, on our website, there's a contact part. So franciscanfriars.com and there's a vocations contact page in there where you can either get a phone number and literally call. We got brothers that are in there in the office that actually return calls. Um, Although it's not like you can't text us or whatever. It's landlines. So it's sort of like back in the cave, you know, caveman days, but give a call or there's also an email where you can shoot an email to and just ask to be able to talk to somebody. So we have come and see visits and the the process is generally a phone conversation with one of the guys on our vocations team who just listens to your story and tries to figure out where are you on the journey of discernment and how can we help you take the next good step. If it seems like it's moving in a direction of our community perhaps, then there's come and see visits and coming on that is just an opportunity to see what is our life like? You know, what does it really look like to live it, to learn more about it? And as that grows and discernment grows and maybe coming back again and eventually guys, you know, if they really seriously think God's calling them, you ask for an application um, and then come on, let's go. (laughs) We certainly are in need of young men who are willing to respond in a radical way to the gospel. I think uh, the world that we live in is, is one that is calling for a response that's all in. If you go for sort of the the sort of the, the I'm not sure route. And there is a fear of commitment. I just want to say that young men like fear of commitment um, is a plague of our society. And it's, it's two things. There's a fear that commitment means a loss of my freedom. And there's a fear that commitment is something that I'm not capable of. And in both cases, the truth sets us free. So to give yourselves into the hand of a living God is the ultimate act of freedom because it's to discover the why for your very existence and to live it. And then to know that when he calls, the grace is not yours, it's his, it's going to be given. So you're actually able with his grace to be faithful to the path that he's calling you to live in your life. So come on. Mm. 
And am I right in thinking that you now have uh, kind of hermitages or Franciscans who are now choosing to be monks? Within our community. Is that right? Yeah, there's a there's a place up in upstate New York, Monticello, New York, where we have a place that's a retreat center. And there mm-hmm. are a group of friars that live there that's a more... Um, kind of eremitical, kind of mm-hmm. use that word again. So sort mm-hmm. of a little bit more of the contemplative version of our life, leading people in retreats, sharing a common life, working with their hands, literally chopping wood for winter um, and doing work on the property, but also dedicating more substantial time to just prayer, silence, intercession. It'll be interesting to see how the spirit moves your community and whether or not there'll be more of these popping up around the country mm. as the demand for it from the friars or the desire for it from the yeah. friars increases. Yeah. And I mean, for us, it's like we, there's a lot of opportunities and invitations that are there right now for us as a community. would be a great place for y'all to move, man. Come talk, on. Talk about a meth <laughs> problem. Talk about homeless problem. Oh, man. man. Yeah. And to be with the poor, that's, that's a core part of the original inspiration for the friars as they wanted to not only minister to the poor, but to live with them. And And I remember being shocked back in the day as I was discerning your order, seeing that one of your, what are they called? Uh, Statements within the constitution was essentially that if you live in an area that becomes financially on the up and up, you then leave to go find the poor. Amen. (laughs) Yeah. If gentrification happens, we're out of here. See ya. And has it happened? Well, it almost did, but the pandemic, I think, stopped it. Yeah. So uh, we have a friary in Harlem that has had quite a significant amount of gentrification in mm-hmm. the neighborhood surrounding the friary. When we moved in, it was a bunch of like crack houses that were boarded up windows. Um, a lot of those old brownstones in New York were bought, renovated, turned over and rented out for high-end apartments. Mm-hmm. But the pandemic really kind of just was a full stop on a lot of things in New York City, as, as many might know, but the gentrification just halted and the poor that were there that we're serving never really left. So there's some, I call them um, SRO, mm. single room occupancy, so government subsidized buildings. Mm. And those folks come to soup kitchens regularly at the Friary, we do home visits to visit them and pray with them and kind of just live in relationship and walk with them. What's your advice to someone who wants to be obedient to Christ and namely mm-hmm. give to those who beg of you, mm-hmm. but at the same time realize that money is maybe not a good idea to mm-hmm. give to this particular individual? Yeah. What what sort of advice do you have for us? I would say uh, the first thing is, is you can always give your presence. So how do I treat this person? Or am I responding and reacting in a way that you're just kind of in the way of what I'm trying to get to and do? Are you a nuisance? Um, Is the fact that you somehow physically appear repulsive to me? How do I respond? Um, So do I give a loving presence? Do I smile? Do I ask their name? Mm -hmm. Am I willing to take the risk and shake their hand? I mean, some people won't even touch them. Think about like human, humanly speaking, like we need touch. And how many of these people have spent the entire day being ignored by other human beings and not being touched by any human being in a way that was recognizing their dignity? Right. Yeah. And so that's, those are, those are things that I see. So like asking their name, shaking their hand, looking them in the eyes. So that's the first piece, give your presence and treat them with dignity and love. And then secondly is, is it error on the side of charity? So if I get to heaven, I'd much rather be standing before the throne of God and him being like, you know what? (laughs) You were wrong about Frank. Yeah. You gave Frank that money. You gave Frank that money and he bought some drugs with it. Yeah. As opposed to Frank hadn't eaten in three days. Or I appeared to you as Frank. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and he does. Jesus comes to us in the poor. If you have the capacity and time, Um, you know, it's like in New York city, sometimes I'm able to just be like, Hey, you hungry, sweet. Let me take you over here and we'll get you something to eat. Um, I recognize with women, it's a little bit more, you just have to safety issue is real. Yeah. Um, I've explicitly told my wife to not do that. (laughs) Don't, don't take someone for a meal. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she used to do it. She's a good woman. And I put men to that. Because I so, love her. Yeah, and there's a, a sense man. of wanting to. Yeah, you want to. Yeah. You want to have a sense of respect for or, or safety for people that you love. Um, but the other thing is, and this is something that you can do, is is like, uh, if you live in a place where you know you're going to meet the poor consistently, be prepared. 
So like, we'll just like fryers, I'll take, and before I'm heading out, I'll throw a bunch of granola bars in my bag mm -hmm. because I know somebody's gonna come and ask me for something. I don't want to give you money because I actually don't think that's for your good. Yeah. And I want what's good for you. Um, but I want to give you something. Yeah. And I also want to have an opportunity just to meet you and encounter you. Yeah. So yeah, I'll bring, you know, I'll chewy, not crunchy because a lot of times if they're homeless and they have addiction issues, they don't have teeth. Um, depending on what kind of drugs are using, you know, but things that are easy to choose soft, you know, sandwiches, things like that. That's um, hopeful. and, and to, to be prepared. So if I know I go to work and it's in a city or I drive through an intersection and there's always people begging, well, now I'm going to like have a little bag that has like a water bottle and a little sandwich and maybe a divine mercy card. Yeah. And I'm like, Hey, here you go. God bless you. What's your name? You know, how can I pray for you? Yeah. Okay. Super simple. But I think goes Thank a you. long way to just being able to meet Jesus in the poor and receive also what he wants to give you through them. Amen. As we wrap up, would you give me your blessing? Mm -hmm. Maybe even Thursday. Yeah, Ooh. come on, let's do it. Well, I'm going to give you a blessing with the, uh, the relic of the habit of St. Francis invoking his intercession. So just ask right now, Heavenly Father, that you would pour forth all the graces that Matt and Thursday need and Ask this grace also extend to their families and loved ones. Um, pray that through the intercession of St. Francis, that they might receive a new grace of conformity to your sacred heart, Jesus. They may receive a grace of a deeper surrender and trust, living with nothing of their own, taking up the cross alone and letting that be their glory, their riches, their life. And pray for protection from the enemy that the peace of Christ may abide in their hearts and their light may shine before men that all may give glory to the Father. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Yeah, thank you. God bless you.